So welcome to the Amherst Planning Board. Uh, it's Tuesday, August 27th. Uh, tonight, uh, Tuesday, usually we're on Wednesdays, and it's 6 p.m., not um, the 7. Uh, okay, so there is six of us, one member missing. Uh, we will start with minutes first. We have three sets, um, so we can do those. We'll start with Wednesday, June 19th. Um, does anyone have any comments or issues or changes for those minutes? I see none. Um, Move we approve the minutes. A second. I'll second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Great. Aye. Okay. Um, Next set of minutes was June 26th. Uh, again, any comments, changes, suggestions? Move we approve the minutes. Can I have a second? Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Raise your hand, say aye. Great. Um, yeah. Yes. One. Uh, two uh, abstentions. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. So, Jack abstains, so we have four people yesing. And the third minutes, July 24th. Any comments, issues, discussion with those? Move we approve the minutes. Second. Second. And um, any more discussion? All in favor, say aye, or raise your hand. Okay, aye, great. Um, so, and Maria abstained on that one, I assume, yes. Okay, good. So, Chris, thank you for all those minutes. <laughs> thank you, Pam. <laughs> credit where credit is due. Um, so, uh, right now we'll do the public comment period this is for anything that's not on our agenda for for this evening and if there's anyone here who just wants to speak to something to the planning board i don't see anyone so we'll move on um, the third item is public hearing site plan review and special permits uh, we did have scheduled for six o'clock main street but i hope you guys don't mind we're gonna try to squeeze in something that came to our attention uh, regarding um, Craig's doors. No problem. And we have a Mr. Gates here. Chris, do you have anything that you want to say about this? Um, ex okay. Mr. Um, so Gates, a number of years ago, um, Craig's doors and the First Baptist Church came to the planning board and requested approval to use the trailer that's behind the First Baptist Church as a service center for homeless people, homeless clients who um, take part in Craig's doors shelter. Um, and the planning board granted that um, approval, but they were concerned about uh, kind of a messy condition behind the trailer. And so the planning board asked that if the trailer be in place in, um, in two or three years, that the church or Craig stores come back with a plan for landscaping that back area. So Mr. Gates is here with a plan for landscaping, and um, two members of the, three members of the planning board uh, took a site visit, and um, possibly one of them would like to explain what they saw, but here's Mr. Gates to present his plan. Mr. Gates, um, is the green light on? Or Yeah, Chris will. And then just say your name and who you're representing. Gerald Gates is my name. I represent uh, First Baptist Church at this point, but it has to do with the concern of uh, Craig's doors also. Uh, the, uh, it was concern from the uh, Craig's doors that they didn't want something that was solid out in back because they felt that people could hide behind it and uh, they wouldn't know they were there. Uh, my concern for the church was that we had something that was solid enough uh, so that it would uh, kind of screen the trailer, but still would have plenty of room in, in, in between it. 
So I put, I think they have the pictures. Yep, Pam or Chris, could we put one of the pictures up, the, just the one showing the, anyway, the back the spring. of the trailer? Mr. Gates, I'm sorry for the interruption. You can continue and yeah. ignore Chris Bester beside you clicking away. <laughs> uh, this spring, I located some grasses that grow about seven feet tall, and they survived right through the winter. They didn't break down. They were strong enough. So that's what you're going to see in the picture is uh, these grass plants uh, put apart so that you can see in between. And then in the summer, uh, you'll see uh, uh, some pictures of flowers yeah, on the uh, university side of those. So as you look, you see the uh, flowers. They're, they're uh, uh, the same ones they use in pots and so forth. Uh, and uh, that would add the color through the summer. In the wintertime, we don't worry about it because the snow plows, plows up piles of snow. <laughs> You have this one, and I we did get that one sent to us in an email. So yes. the, the board has yeah, seen okay. that picture. So that's um, what we're proposing we do. We also went over with the uh, three people that came about uh, keeping the place in order. We do park uh, two trailers in there. One of them picks up food today. It was 1,700 pounds of food for uh, tomorrow which we give out, the church gives out to a food pantry to about 90 to 100 families. And uh, we also provide food during the week for uh, the community breakfast. And we uh, also provide food to the cafe that operates in the church. Thank now, you. Now the other trailer is one that picks up bottles and cans from the landfill and uh, we sort them in the back everything is under cover when we get through and uh, those are the two trailers the other items that are there are where the water comes up from the church down into the trailer and also we have a marker for the sewage that goes out and goes back up to the church okay thank you um, it might be helpful to have a report about the site visit. Um, I don't know if uh, Maria or Janet, one of you want to. Um, um, Thank you. The Maria. three of us, sure. Um, the three of us were there, uh, I think it was yesterday, and um, we did see the sort of hitch trailer being pulled off, and it's like a. 12 foot trailer that's just attached to the back of a pickup and it was pulling some recycling bins away and so that trailer and another sort of the food cart trailer you're talking about are the only two large objects behind the sort of temporary structure what we call Craig Store's trailer and um, it was much tidier than I don't remember what year it was now maybe two years ago where there were a lot of um, shop tools and paint buckets and just debris in general and a lot of bags of cans sort of along the entirety of the backside. And when we went, it was just um, a stainless steel table with some tools on top that were covered by a tarp and part of a plumbing system, I imagine. It was like a sewage ejector and then a holding tank of some kind behind the shed. And it actually looked really tidy, um, to be honest. And um, we saw the grasses and they were maybe six to eight feet apart from each other. Um, the flowers that uh, Mr. Gates mentioned were not installed yet, but um, he provided a photo to sort of uh, um, illustrate that. But um, in general, it, it was much more um, tidy and clean and did not look like sort of the backyard of a space anymore. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. Oh, these are um, photos that they're passing down. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, at this time, are there any questions from the board for Mr. Gates? Uh, um, so, any questions? Sure. Uh, I, I Great. Um, Mr. Gates, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm just a little puzzled. A few months ago, Mr. Weiss came, as I understood, the, as the 
the chairman of the board for Craig's Doors. You're here on behalf of the church that owns the property that permits Craig's Doors trailer and operations to go on. And there was, you know, during, and you had appeared before at Eastern Long, I was here before, uh, at a previous um, family board meeting. And, and I'm a little just still confused as to in what capacity and who is speaking on behalf of Craig's Doors and what, you know, what, and what authority, you know, what, what, what action is being asked and by whom. Because there's, when Mr. Weiss was here, it, that, that, was, that was the central question and that it, it's not really been resolved as far, at least in this moment, in this, in this meeting, and so I'm just not clear as to, you know, in what, in what authority, who is asking for what here, other than to meet a several year ago, several years ago, planning board condition, right? To That's correct. Uh, that was uh, Craig's door's use of the trailer. The uh, church rents that portion that the trailer sets on. The land outside of that trailer uh, is First Baptist Church. I think at the time that I came before, I was chairman of the board of uh, Craig's Doors, and I'm now off the board. And uh, so Jerry Weiss was uh, answering to the original uh, petition that came before the board to use the trailer as a media, uh, um, a center for homeless. And uh, I'm here representing the church and what goes on behind the trailer on the church property. So he, he was concerned at the use of the church. You granted that use, but in that granting of that use, there was a two or three year period that we were supposed to come back and give some sort of uh, uh, landscape set up. The shelter, when Jerry Weiss was here, uh, was concerned about people hiding out back, which we're concerned about also. So I think that what I'm presenting to you uh, lasts through the winter, has camouflage as far as the parking lot of the university. And what they saw uh, the other day, we agreed to keep it looking that way. Uh, and uh, so there's really two things going on here. But Jerry Weiss is more concerned about answering the two or three year period that, that really Craig's Doors has, that you granted. So my understanding that, sorry Chris, may I follow up? Absolutely. My understanding then is that the church will be maintaining this covering of the grasses and the flowers Yes. That and and thus satisfying the condition for Craig's Doors use of the of that space for the planning board. Yeah, they don't. The Craig's Doors doesn't use that space. The church uses it. The church only has granted them the uh, property that the trailer sets on. So it's really the church that is saying to you, yes, we will keep that at this point. Uh, I would benefit, uh, because I didn't know this was on the agenda, um, Chris, can you provide some perspective and an intro just so I can get my head back into what we're talking about here, because uh, I'm totally confused. So initially, if you will recognize me, initially um, Craig's doors approached the planning board to have a feeding shelter or feeding uh, station in the trailer behind um, the church at the Baptist Church. The Baptist Church houses Craig's Doors, which is a shelter for people in the winter from the 1st of November to the 1st of April, but they didn't have any place to have dinner. They wanted to have dinner earlier than the shelter actually opened. So the trailer was set upon church property and the planning board gave um, permission to have that shelter there, have that trailer there. Then Craig Stores decided it was easier to feed people inside the church rather than have them be fed in the trailer. And so they moved the feeding operation 
back into the church. And then they had the trailer on site, and they <coughs> said, oh, well, let's use the trailer for um, a service center for people who are using Craig's doors, um, a, a place where people can come to get advice about um, looking for a job or looking for an apartment or whatever kind of help that they might need, being a homeless people who don't really have access to a lot of services. So um, Craig's Stores has been operating the trailer as a service center for people who use Craig's Stores. Um, during this process, the planning board um, was willing to grant permission for the trailer to be there and to be used in these ways but the planning board was disappointed in the way the back of the trailer was maintained. Um, there's also an operation that Mr. Gates is involved in, which um, uses people who stay in the shelter as workers for the bid, and they get paid for working for the bid. So they do a lot of cleaning up around the downtown, and some of the material that they bring from downtown, they end up storing behind the trailer. So there are really kind of three uses, I guess, back there. One is uh, Craig's Doors has the trailer there. One is that the BID, the Business Improvement District, has um, two uh, small trailers that can be dragged by a, a car or a truck uh, that pick up material from the downtown. And three is that um, all three groups store materials in those sheds that are behind the trailer. And a lot of that material kind of spilled out into the area behind the trailer and it became very messy. There were white buckets and orange cones and all kinds of things back there. So the planning board said you really have to screen it. And there was a discussion about should there be a fence to screen it or should there be uh, planting to screen it. And some members of the planning board wanted one thing and some wanted another. Um, Craig Stores and the church were concerned that if there were too solid a screening there that people would um, hide there and you know there would be nefarious activities happening there. So um, the uh, church is now coming forth with this plan to have tall grasses, which will grow up to six feet tall, placed about, I think, 10 feet apart, maybe? I'm not exactly sure, but that seemed like about the spacing. And then in front of those, on the UMass side, they want to plant um, flowers in the springtime. So the people who went on the site visit saw the grasses there. They were actually planted in place, and they were probably about four feet tall as of this point. Um, and now you're being asked to determine whether that um, meets the requirement for um, providing a landscape plan for the back of the trailer. Um, the third photo has, <laughs> a, like, is that real or is that uh, a design? Proposing what it will look like in time. Okay. It's a schematic. Uh, yes, Janet. Um, I'm confused about who applied for the special permit and whether a person representing that group is here. Is the because my thing says this, it's a special permit. Craig's Doors filed the request for a site plan review approval. And then there's no one from Craig's Doors here, is that correct? And then you're representing the church who hasn't made that application. I was chairman so, of Craig's Doors at the time that that was applied for, and I was the one that came before you. So do we have a representative of Craig's Doors now, or do you not know? No, Jerry sorry? Weiss came in uh, representing Craig's Doors and what they wanted to do in the trailer. Uh, that was what. Uh, so I'm just wondering who applied for the site plan for the permit? I, I did, yeah. as chairman of the Craig Stores. That was, what, two, two years ago, three years ago? So, Chris, if I can just clarify. So, Mr. Gates has been before us mm -hmm. a few times, and then we had asked for, by March of 2019, for this to be followed up on and finished. And at that time, um, it was Mr. Weiss who came before us. And he said that we, they hadn't really acted on that. I don't, I don't think it was forgotten, but it, it just hadn't been not gotten to. So we said, well, you still need to come back. So this is the, the plantings were made, an effort has been made, the place has been tidied up. Um, so I think what they're asking is, do you have permission to be here tonight and speak on behalf of Craig's Doors and finish 
Yes. This. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I was just confused about who was representing who and when. Um, I have a, just a comment, two questions. Another question is, when is the um, trailer in operation? Um, like what times of the year? Is it year round or is the it? The smaller trailers, trailer. So. Well, I meant, I meant the building, the, the portable trailer, the yeah. portable building. Oh, that's used year round. Okay. There has been for the last two years because they've had people in there. There's a nurse that comes. Uh, the office was moved down there. Uh, when we asked to go from feeding to uh, uh, just uh, office, uh, and a lot of the homeless meet in there to find homes and get get homes or get jobs uh, from us uptown. Uh, and that's what it's used for now. The last two years it's been open all summer. Chris, a question. Um, so is this still a temporary use? Like how is this whole process? Is there an end time on it or? Go ahead. Um, it is, quote, a temporary use. I think the church has plans to expand their building at some point and incorporate Craig Store's shelter into that building. I, I haven't seen those plans, but I've heard Mr. Gates talk about them and I've heard others talk about them. I think it's gonna take quite a while for them to raise the money to do this project. And um, it's going to be a complicated project. And so it's taking them longer than they expected it to take. Um, and so that's, that's all I can really say. So this is temporary in okay. quotes, but we don't have an end, end date. Thank you. We have hired an architect. The church has hired an architect, and they've worked on the master plan. In that master plan, there is room for a shelter uh, up to or a little larger than what we have we're a year round uh, they would right now they can't come in too early because the church is a very busy church uh, and when they came it's the only place they could find in the <clears throat> in the town and uh, uh, so we said yes you can come in but it's it's got to be under certain conditions but when we build a new one we'll make a place for them for year round um, okay, so this is all helpful, and the temporary part sort of puts it more in a framework of what kind of problem we're trying to solve here. I um, have to go uh, the 17th, I think it is, to Boston, because uh, Rob Morrow has to turn down the request of the church to use it for shelter, because the church is not completely sprinkled. So he has to turn it down. Then I have to go to Boston and they give me a variance for a three-year period. And uh, I, I think if the planning board is going to take a position, it would be good to follow that three-year cycle because every three years, Rob has to turn it down every year for three years, and uh, then the st I have to go back to the state if we're not in the building mode at that time. That would keep uh, the planning board up to date with what the church is doing and what Craig Stores is doing. I hear you in the sense of that. I just, with regard to the plantings is what we're really talking yeah. about today. It, where we left it last time, it was sort of like fence or plantings, but the real problem was the mess. And yeah. what I observed at the site visit is it was neat and tidy. Yeah. So, um, and hearing about these temporary options, maybe a fence is not needed um, and you have the grasses planted, I assume the flowers would be planted next spring. Yes. Um, is there a way, Chris, that we can okay this and then maybe the town follows up next summer just to make sure, not just the plantings, but that it's still tidy and neat? I can make a note to myself to do that, yes. Um, any other questions? from the board um, okay so we would need a motion now Chris to um, approve this level of plan approve that this plan uh, that Mr. Gates is presenting meets the requirement of that condition that was in the site plan review approval um, I will just, before we, someone says, repeats that, I just want to ask the public here if there's any questions regarding this, this issue. 
Um, I don't see any hands. So um, is anyone here comfortable? For us, anyone else have any other questions or issues or are we ready to make a motion? I move to approve the site plan submission mm -hmm. and um, that the conditions have been met from uh, the uh, 2017 site plan review conditions. I hope I said that right. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Enough that um, anyone want to second that? I'll second that. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion? Chris, anything else we forgot? Good. All right. So um, all in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. So unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Gates. I hope you have a green thumb. Thank you for being patient. Okay. Of course. So we'll go to the next one. Um, we're going to continue the hearing from July 24th. This is SPR 2020-01 and SPP 2020-01, 462 Main Street, LLC, Center East Commons. And we have uh, a follow-up from our applicants Perfect. and their lawyer. That's and, right. Thank you <laughs> and, very much. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything to add? I just wanted to say something before we get started, which is that uh, Ms. Chow was not present in, on July 24th, but she has submitted a letter saying that she's reviewed all of the materials and watched the video of the July 24th meeting, and she feels that she is eligible to vote on this project, and she submitted a statement in writing. Thank you. That's the Mullen rule, is that? Great. Thank you. So. Your rule? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, <laughs> members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst here on behalf of the applicant for 62 Main LLC. In its application, as the chairwoman noted, uh, for a site plan review and a special permit for the property at 462 Main Street here in Amherst. Uh, with me this evening, we've got um, the manager of 462 Main, the, the property, owner, property owner, John Robleski, and then we have our architect, Christine Royal. Um, so as a quick background, we were here on the 24th. We talked about what was existing on the site. We talked about the site. We had our engineer here. We talked about the parking. We talked about the traffic. Um, we talked a bit about management. And then we, um, I think the clock struck like 1045, and I think everybody um, turned into a pumpkin. So we are back here to hopefully talk about architecture, um, respond to any questions that you may have. As you may recall, we had a, what I would consider a short list of homework to provide to you, um, cut sheets for the lighting, which Christine will get into, photometric plan, which she will get into. We have provided draft copies of the commercial and residential leases. They're drafts, they're not finalized yet, but we provided those um, for your records. We've got a parking management plan uh, and a complaint response plan, which I believe were submitted initially, but we wanted to make sure that you had those. Um, and then, you know, other than that, I think uh, John did a really great job baking this to a point where there was a complete submission initially, and I think that's why we're here tonight at this earlier hour. So um, with my thanks uh, for your amenability and meeting, I'll turn it over to Christine to talk about the architecture. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Royal. I'm an architect working with Maple Street Architects out of Northampton. We've been working on this project. I'm happy to walk through the architectural design with you at this point. As you can see, in front of you is a rendering of the west facade of the building. We've taken some steps to really address the massing and the scale of this project as it runs north to south uh, along this site. So we're working with a few different roof heights. We're working with stepping the building back and forward. 
along that sight line so that the view from Main Street is not overwhelming. Um, as Tom Reedy had mentioned in, or we had gone through the other evening, this is mixed use, so this contains both residential, one, two, and three bedroom units, as well as a business unit. The business unit in this rendering is on the right-hand side, on the lower, mm -hmm, on the south end, on the first floor. Great. So this is the view from Main Street, and you can see the existing building on the left-hand side, and then the proposed new construction on the right-hand side, and the steps that we've taken to address the massing and the scale of the project. So the fronts are also garrisoned. There's a short overha overhang on the first floor, as well as a porch-like overhang that's similar in language to the original building. We're also working with uh, clapboard and shingle siding, as well as the detail around the eaves and the gables to help unify the site and the language that's there on Main Street. A little hard with the shadow of the light up there. This is the site plan. I think we went through the site plan pretty exhaustively in the last meeting with the civil engineer, the layout of the parking, the existing building, all of the stormwater management. Um, so you can see that we have the setbacks um, along the sides and the rear of the building and the existing curb cut in from Main Street and the new parking proposal. I think maybe one thing to note on this is that um, there was a, a renegade step and light at the rear of that office space back here. Uh, that has been removed. We have not removed it from the engineering plans yet, but assuming uh, hopefully we'll get approved this evening, we would update those plans and submit a final set to the town showing that the step and the light were also removed. Right. So with regard to the overall height of the building, you can see we're just over 37 feet to the midpoint of the average height of the roofs. Um, which is well below the 40-foot restriction on this site. This is the site lighting plan. So we have three types of lights on the building or in the site. One is a site pole mounted light. Those are called out, uh, they're 12 foot pole lights. There's one at the north end of the parking. There's one in the center. Meet. So this is the first one at the north end. There's one here in this landscaped area that divides the parking. And there's another here near the entry. We're also working with bollard lights. So low bollard lights along the pathways that are at the edge of the parking and adjacent to the residential and business area. We also have recessed canopy lights in the porch-like overhang that's along the west sides of the buildings at the entries. Um, and we've also, in the site photometric plan and on this plan, called out the existing uh, lights on the existing building. So these are re these are surface mounted ceiling lights on the porch of the existing building as well as some uh, wall sconces on the exterior of the existing. So this plan shows the photometric distribution of the individual lights. All of these are being specified at 3000 color, the Kelvin, the color temperature of the light, which I think you're all interested in as well as no less than 70 for a color rendering index. Oh, yes. And, of course, they're also all dark sky compliant. Thank you for that reminder. So this is the existing sign on the property that calls out the business use in the existing building. We plan on uh, refurbishing this, keeping the existing form as it is, not making it any bigger or relocating it, 
um, enlisting the new potential uh, business operations on the site as well as the name of the Residential Development Center East Commons. This is the general landscaping plan that talks about uh, the trees and the shrubbery and the plantings that we're looking at for uh, use around the site. Most of it is centered along the parking and at the edges uh, of the new construction. And then lastly, this is our site photometric plan. We worked with a vendor to identify the lights that we would work with as well as their uh, performance capabilities. All of the zeros indicate uh, zero foot candles, which is important for no light trespass at the edge of the property line. We're working with an average of one foot candle across the parking lot. Uh, so with no more than a four foot candle hot spot so that we're reducing the glare and keeping the lighting fairly even, although low across the site. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking at 3,000 for the color temperature of all of the lights. The site pole lights have both type 2, type 3, and type 4 distribution, which just means the shape of the light pattern as it hits the ground. The bollard lights are all type 3, which is long and rectangular as they run along the sidewalks. Um, and lastly, as I had mentioned, the color rendering index, the minimum that we're working with is 70. The color rendering index is what allows you to tell the difference between a black shirt and a navy shirt and a green shirt in the dark. Sure. Um, so, so this photometric plan is what we worked with with the vendor for the lights as we've put them across. There is an existing light pole at the edge of the site. That light has not been incorporated into this study, clearly. And this is the existing uh, curb cut onto Main Street. So I'm, I'm happy to back it up to the rendering and answer any questions or talk about any comments that you might have. Any questions from the board? They're all looking at their plants. I have a little one. Sure. Um, either the, well, it could be the, I don't have it, the site plan that shows the lights where you're installing them. And then looking at the light distribution, I do notice the trash room is sort of like the ramp that goes up to it. Is yes. there going to be a wall-mounted light there or anything? Because it, it does look dark there. Sure. Let me work on um, zooming in. I have to look at the little screen to do that. Sure, so we have a bollard light indicated here for the pathway, and there's an existing wall sconce as well as an existing uh, surface mounted and another existing wall sconce on the building. So in this area, there is a decent amount of light with the addition of the bollard for access to that area, and the sight light is not far away. Just on the photometric, yeah, if you zoom in there, I'm just concerned about where the ramp, when you're actually getting into that little nook to go into the trash room. And just on a follow-up, we don't usually get on the inside, but I assume when you go in, there's automatic lights that will go on or something like that. So I'm just trying to think of safety if you're sure. bringing your trash out or whatever. As far as occupancy sensors. So there is a limitation when we're working with vendors for their understanding of the existing lights and what you know, what light they put out, which is why this says zero at that point. So we do know that there are existing lights on the building that we plan on maintaining, and that with the bollard light um, in this space that we're, we should have more than enough. This is one foot candle right here at the, in the middle, and two and a half, I know it's hard to read there, two and a half foot candles at the bollard light. And I think that, 
Mr. Robleski would, if it, if it was any concern, put an additional light there tucked away in the corner to make sure that there's not an issue. Yeah, or replace the existing with a light that could be photometrically planned. Do any other board members have see a concern that I have a question about where the door to the trash room is. Is it just dark there? No, the door to the trash room is not dark. Let's see. I think it's in it. Pull up. Yeah. I don't think we have a site plan that shows the door location. Do we have the first one? Yes. The trash room's that back part of the existing building, right? Yeah, so this is this is a sidewalk going into the trash room and the bikes are at the on the side, the bike shed. Yeah, letting it catch up a little bit. Yep. So I think this this is the location of where the right John, this is where the trash door will be. Mm -hmm. It's currently on the north side, but it's being relocated to, to this side at the end of that. A sidewalk. A sidewalk. And if you could just pull that down a little bit. Yeah, um, this this seems to be frozen. It's oh, taking well, we a hadn't moment talked to about the wheelchair ramp that's there for access. Is, is that what that is there on the north uh, the north side of the building? There is no wheelchair ramp. I, that's what I was wondering. So what is the? There was the trash room where the existing door is, and then I understood that it was being moved to the east side, which mm -hmm. we can see the ramp there. It's the sidewalk, yes. And then is there anything on the north side of the building? I see some lines, a, a bike rack. Um, so I'm just wondering that area, if we go back to the this photometric, it's, it says it's all zeros at the door of the trash room and the bike racks. So that's what I'm sort of having the concern about. Yep, I understand your concerns. Uh, so as I had mentioned, there is an existing light here and there are others along the porch, uh, two wall sconces and a surface mounted ceiling light, but the vendor is only able to model the lights in the photometric plan that they provide. That is really the limitation. When the board asks for a photometric plan, it makes us work with a vendor who can supply the plan but then they only will show the lights that they are providing. I understand yeah. that. So you're saying there's an existing light on the north there are, side. There are three existing so lights. So I just need you to assure us that those sure. are going to be similar to what you're proposing. They'll be downward facing, they like are. sky compliant. Right. That's what, so even though the door will be taken out, the electricity, that will stay there and there'll be a light. Yes. That goes on and off with like the other lights. Right. Okay. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions about the other information they brought back to us? Um, if we have look at the list. I just had a question about the sign. I know we got a photo in here that yes. is showing a light that is in a bush. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The existing, yeah. yeah. Yes, so this is the planted area, and there is a light here for the sign. Let's see if I have a better picture of that.
So that is the light that you're asking about. Yes. Yeah, and you have and it's some working or going to be replaced. It's just we'll ultimately make sure that the lights there are functioning right now. I think the photos you got were the ones that John you had sent, um, which just show that the the lights are in a poor state of repair and, and not functioning. <laughs> so, yeah, ultimately we will and we'll make sure that they're focused. I mean, they're going to be up lighting. That's the type of sign that this is, but they'll be focused on the sign so as to not just be floodlights going straight up in the air. They will be focused on the sign. And this would be done before the new building is opened and yeah. along with all the crew. Yeah. Um, Janet, did you have a question? I have a question about the lease. And um, it's you, there's not going to be students allowed on this property. You're not going to lease to students. How do you enforce that? Is that in the lease or where will that be? Are you about yes. Uh, yes, undergrads, thanks. That's a policy of ours. You know, we have the property next door, and that's really enforced through the vetting process, the application process. The students are not a protected class. So it's not a requirement of the lease. It's just you don't lease to undergraduates as a policy. Yeah, we have the, you know, 12 units next door, and we've never had uh, undergraduates there. It's kind of a mix of professionals and graduate students, um, working couples, uh, professionals from Japan. So it's, it's a good mix, and that's what we intend to do here also. Michael. Uh, to follow up on that question, um, <clears throat> I... I, I've been on this board for a number of years now, and I have always been under the impression that it was not possible to discriminate against undergraduates in rental uh, processes. Uh, now, you're saying you can do that. Uh, I'd like some clarification as to why that is permissible and why it has not been permissible in other developments that have uh, when, where this issue has arisen. Sure. So I think to, to put a finer point on it, I think the word discrimination is the one we want to stay away from. And I, I think what Mr. Robleski is saying is he's not discriminating against them by not allowing them in. in. He is just, as we've seen with uh, other conditions of other developments, um, choosing marketing strategies that elicit the types of tenants that he wants. And I think that, buffered with the fact that uh, students are not a protected class, because I think, stepping back, if he went in and said, I'm not going to rent to any students, there's probably going to be an issue with that, um, whether it's um, that, he, that he is discriminating and somebody wants to take a shot at saying you're discriminating, you can't do that, and now's the time and we're going to make an example of you, or um, there are some other reasons why they can say, yeah, you're saying it's because we're students, but it's really because we're fill in some other protected class. So I think we want to be careful about saying discrimination on the one hand, because I think you're right. Um, while they may not be a protected class, you always want to be, you, you, know, you don't want to discriminate. But I think what Mr. Robleski can do is gear his marketing efforts towards folks that he, he wants in there. And so it's, it's the media through which he communicates. It's uh, the references. It's, it's whether he goes through the undergraduate housing or he goes through a graduate study program or um, the different advertising devices. So I, just, I think we want to be careful about it because I don't want the representation to be he is discriminating against students. I think he has done a great job in his existing property, and I trust will do a great job at this property. Um, to make sure that it's appropriately managed and that for him to do that, he finds that uh, the marketing mediums he uses is the, the best to accomplish that. If you want a lawyer answer, that's a, a, as lawyer as I can get, but. Can I have so, so. Uh, sorry. Oh, okay. can you let Michael finish up. Um, I, it strikes me that this is um, slippery. Um, I think a, a fairer question to the developer is, will you accept an undergraduate as a, a tenant? 
Is it a matter of my policy to this point? No. Uh, how do you justify that? Marketing aside, I understand that the marketing strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if some undergraduate with the right amount of cash comes in off the street, how can you say, I'm sorry, I, can't, I won't rent to you? I don't know that you can. I don't, I don't know that I mean, we haven't had conversations about that, saying turn people down if they are undergraduates. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer, to be honest. I mean, if you look on some of the marketing um, sites, you know, like AmersRent.com and so forth, a lot of them do say no undergraduates. I think this has been through the process, you know, a few times, and landlords are able to do that. And it's, you know, the kind of property we want to maintain, because, you know, I know what the undergraduate scenario could be. And we want to we want to avoid that. I mean, I have a house further down Main Street that's always been undergraduates, but we manage it the same, and we never had any issues. So it's you know a lot to to be said. I think in a way it's managed, and the way it, the application process goes. Also, I meet with the parents down there for the undergrad, and give them my phone number, my cell phone, everything. It's communication back and forth. Uh, I understand the um, goals of your uh, policy, and uh, I'm in sympathy with them. Um, my question really re is not so much to you as it is a general question relative to many of the other developments that we have discussed in the last three years at this board. Uh, in many cases, uh, it has been said that it is impossible to eliminate undergraduates from buildings because it, they are, although the word protected class may not have been used, uh, that has been the assumption. Um, and I'd like to, I just want to make it clear for the board and for the record that in this case, we are assuming the developer has the option to exclude undergraduates so that when this issue comes up again, we can tell developers that, that yes, you have the option to exclude undergraduates if you choose to do so. And that may be an issue that we need to think about as a board in the future. Janet? So um, I think that's a great question and we should figure it out. Partly, I was just reading the Amherst Housing Market Study and they were recommending that apartments be built for non-students, undergraduate students, to kind of open up space for families and you know people in their 20s and so. So that'd be a great legal question to answer. But it also makes me look at this building somewhat differently because you're not gonna always be the owner of the, of the building. And so I think we have to consider that in the future, you know, these apartments could be filled with undergraduate students or partially filled and what would the impact be on the neighborhood? in a building that's maybe not so well managed. I know we have the bylaw and things like that, but I think we should look at it as this looks like it's gonna be a really well managed situation, but future owners may not adhere to that. And so we should think about that impact as we discuss. Any other questions? Um, yes. Yeah, also on the lease, um, another, yeah. Another issue that's ar arising it has to do with um, subletting and the potential airbnb or, or the short-term rental um, possibilities. And, and uh, in just glancing at, not really studying at all, the uh, subletting provision, it doesn't seem as if that's, there's, there's protections against that. Um, and I'm wondering if you've given that thought what your thoughts are, if, they're, if, if it's consistent with being concerned about you know, short-term turnover and, 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 and conversion of your use of these spaces for other purposes, um, uh, how, how you would protect against that? Well, our subletting policy, as it says in the lease there, is you know, they, the subletter would have to go through the same application process as the original tenant. 
So we would go through that same process and, and not until I approve that sublet are they allowed in. So as far as the Airbnb, I've never really considered that type of thing, but I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't foresee that ever happening. I mean, I have two daughters. Uh, one of them is very interested in the real estate and I foresee it staying in the family for a good long time. So I guess I can't answer what's going to happen, you know, 20, sure. 25 years down the road, but uh, all, all I can say is that's our intention at this point is to manage it the same as we have next door and further down Main Street with the undergrads. And I think if, if the, the short-term rental, the Airbnb is, I think it's likely deemed some sort of subletting, like a quasi-subletting, and I think if, if uh, a, a tenant were to I mean, because Airbnbs are advertised online, and so if Mr. Robleski saw that one of his units, one of the uh, units was advertised online, I think the next thing is a, a call or a visit to the person that's there saying, you know what our subletting provision is. And then I think the next step is for us to have a conversation about whether Airbnb makes sense at all, short-term rental makes sense at all, because I think part of it is um, if somebody's um, hard up against it and they're a professor and they're going to visit at some other university can and they have to pay the rent to Mr. Robleski, but they can't find somebody to take their lease, what can they do? And is Airbnb some sort of solution? And we just haven't vetted the question yet. Um, but I don't think just on its face it's something that we should immediately say no. Um, but it's something I think we have to talk about some more. Could that possibly be a condition of the approval? I mean, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'd, rather than get into a situation like that, I would let the unit stay vacant for a period of months until the next turnover time. Is that something we usually do? With Is that exactly what was the question? Um, what, what could be a condition of the approval? I wasn't sure that I understood that. Um, well, it could come from the board, or do you want to propose what you'd be comfortable with putting on that as a condition? Or You're asking me? Or you <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I would suggest that he not put that condition okay. on it. If, if it was up, if it was up to me, I'd say, <laughs> of, of course. I mean, leave it to see what the, the market dictates, and then if, if there's an issue, then um, I mean, we can address it at, at that time. But I think just to, I think John has proved himself as a as a, a valuable property owner and property manager. I think you've got. I've taken a look at the list of potential conditions, and you've got one in there where if John's no longer the, the manager, the next manager has to come in at a public meeting and, and review and have that new management plan approved, um, which I think if there have been issues at the property at that time, there's the opportunity to address them. So um, I would suggest we don't impose that condition. Okay, thank you for making that clear. Sure. So does the board want to propose something that's a condition? Are we talking about Airbnb specifically? I'm just thinking about the expansion of the the the, the, the possibility of, of tenants, current tenants, posting online whether it's couch surfing or 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 you know you moving into the common room and, and then, then then posting online the bedroom for short term rentals that may fly under the radar of the otherwise vigilant and scrupulous Mr. Roblowski. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident in, in the management, but, but I'm just, I'm, as these things develop and we are trying to not anticipate 30 years in advance, but be a little more proactive in, in thinking about develop, you know, changing uses to the, the projects that are approved. Can, can I jump in? I have, I have that in my leases with my tenants that they cannot do Airbnbs. Yeah. I just don't really want them profiting off of my, that way. So that could be a lease condition. So are you proposing that we put a condition that they do not allow for Airbnb or anything like that in their buildings? <laughs> My issue with it right now is, is it, it's not exactly spot zoning, but 
this is an issue. It is an issue that we have to look to to all of our buildings, and, and maybe we need to get reactive to this is holistically and come up with something on how we can apply this to to all and not just micro on one. This is where I get uncomfortable. But Chris, do you have some feelings on this? Well, I think the state is coming up with some regulations about I this, guess. and the town probably should look at this very carefully. I think the intention is there to look at it. There just hasn't been the time. And it does seem to me to be a more global problem than just focused on this particular Absolutely. property. So yeah. I think that, you know, as a town, we should really look at this issue, but perhaps not um, make this condition for this particular property at this time. I feel comfortable that he's an experienced landlord, and it's pretty obvious that he wouldn't want to have Airbnbs coming in and out of his building. Uh, you expressed how careful you are about subletting. Um, so I assume that that would just go to a higher level also. Um, it, it is an important issue, and it's going to keep coming up. But um, okay. I, so, you know, Chris, please, oh, not, please, you know, keep us abreast of, because I know the state is trying to, you know, they got the taxes out, now they're cranking on some. And it, and it is changing all over the country. <clears throat> My daughter is in Hawaii right now, and she is in the last two weeks of doing Airbnbs. And well, and, well she's in Honolulu because they won't be allowed to do Airbnbs anymore. So it oh, wow. is changing. Yeah. Yes, Janet. Um, I have a question about the parking waiver, and um, which is Section 7.9 of the zoning bylaw. And I just wanted to clarify that you're asking for a waiver under 7.910, which is that peak parking needs generated by on-site uses occur at different times. Because there's not enough parking and you're asking for a waiver. And I know that at the site visit, you were saying that you know this day use by your offices and you're expecting your tenants to be off and you know, driving about. And so you they're going to be at different times. I just want to clarify that's what you're seeking. That's the ground. Yeah, so that I think uh, what we're seeking is twofold. So that's part of it is that there are like complementary uses. You have the office use because it's a mixed use site. So you've got the office uses which occur you know, eight to five, nine to five, mm -hmm. and then you have um, the residential uses which occur at the opposite hours, you know, eight to eight mm -hmm. uh, or five to eight, depending. Um, but then also your bylaw requires that two spaces be provided for every dwelling unit. What we're asking for, we're saying we're not going to meet that. What we're meeting is some lesser amount um, where we're providing the number of spaces. Let me get it out here so I don't misspeak. So I think we've got um, one space per, uh, and I think it should be in your packet, one space per one and two bedroom and then two spaces for each of the three bedrooms. Uh, and so we're, we're looking for a waiver from strict compliance with application of two, uh, two spaces per unit. Michael? Are those restrictions uh, expressed in the lease? Yes, they, they will be. They, it will be for each. So for one bedroom, they will have one parking space designated to it. Yes. And that goes to, I think at the last meeting, I said the property next door, we have 40 bedrooms there. And through the years at the park, and the number of cars per bedroom ratio has gone down. Um, I just had four uh, grad students come and visit today. They signed a new lease for number eight, and one has a car. They like the location, you know, the bus stop right there in front of the building here. So they actually walk from 22 High Street right to the front of that office that we're proposing there, right to the bus stop, which is right at that telephone pole in front of the building. So I think location has a lot to do with it, and that's what they're looking for. Grad students don't typically have a lot of money and sometimes don't have a car, and that's what we've seen over the years. Even the professionals, uh, they have one car. So you said you have 40 spots next door, and I think at the last meeting you had said something that you had been doing some loose counts and it was more in the... I think four years ago we had, well, years back when we first built it, 20 years ago, I think we had like 30 cars and there's 34 parking spaces. Um, the last four years have gone 28, 27, 
the last two years, including the upcoming year, 23. Wow. So that also means you do have some overflow parking in that other building because it's not usually ever maxed out. There, yeah, there's always spaces there. I mean, you can drive in there most any time and, you know, even on a Sunday morning and see that there's probably six or eight empty spaces easily. All right, thank you. Maria? Um, first, I want to say I really appreciate the way the architecture has stepped down at the street to really keep with the scale of the houses. So um, I just want to put that out there. And um, so we're talking about parking. Have you designated which ones are for the business versus residential? I didn't quite catch it in the plan. I think it came down to the, when you look at the ratio, if I understand your question, are you asking how many spaces are required for the business? Oh, no, or actually, just is that actually designated? Yeah. Actually, so there are some it? compact spaces as, as well as full size spaces. And okay. are you looking to designate the spaces for the office versus residential? No. Exactly. No. Okay. No. And the other question is um, as far as the construction staging, are the, is the existing building still in use during construction or? Mm -hmm. So do you have a plan for like um, staging and management of the? Yeah, the current tenant there, he said um, he's only got two employees. Um, we actually had one of the bigger tenants just move out. Um, they deal with some children that have speech difficulties and some physical difficulties and found that the old building wasn't quite meeting their needs and they moved actually right to the center of town. So the one tenant that's still there is the Crossman Properties and he's the one that's going to move into the new <coughs> but he can stay there you know during that time um, he's familiar with the vfw and if you remember we have the uh, permission from the vfw which is directly across the street so we don't foresee that as an issue janet so i i um i have done some bad math on your um, parking thing because I thought that you were had enough spaces to account for your your residential use and so I see in the parking waiver section that if you have peak parking needs generated by on-site uses occurring at different times I was thinking oh okay so you know people are out during the day the offices I don't see anything in the bylaw that lets the board just say they wanted less they didn't think they were going to need that much. And th there are some conditions that we could reduce it, but I don't see where that would be met by just saying, we just don't think we're going to need that much. And so that's sort of my, where I'm hanging right now. Chris? Um, we have traditionally relied on section 7.9 of the bylaw, which says any section or subsection of article 7.0 parking regulations may be waived or modified by the permit granting board or special permit granting authority authorized to act under the applicable section of the bylaw for compelling reasons of safety, aesthetics, or site design. So I think that's what they're asking for um, their modification under 7.90. Also, Chris, um, when was that bylaw last edited or created? Do you know? Because to me, it's sort of an old, it's been around a long time. And it's sort of like the Airbnb things, you know, trends are changing. And this is another area that we're going to have to look at to bring up to modern times. It, it, might, it might be an old law, but it is a law. And um, I would just be happy if you would come up with a compelling reason of safety, aesthetics, or site design. And so not any reason, but like a compelling sure. reason. Well, so. I think, I mean, site design is the reason. Um, when you look at how linear the site is and the number of parking spaces that can fit on the site. Um, plus, um, when you, I think one of the uh, board members mentioned um, the scaling and the massing of the property. Uh, when you look at the site and how it can be developed, and I'll, I'll even step back further and say, this was a site that was rezoned some number of years ago to allow uses specifically like this. And so the only way to make a meaningful uh, development is to design it like this. And so what we've got to do is, because of the linear nature of the site, um, place the parking on each side of that drive aisle. And as a result, there's only a certain number of parking spaces that we can get where we end up with the 32. And I think with that, um, especially giving past planning board practice, um, 
Mr. Robleski's uh, testimony relative to the, the actual number of parking spaces that are needed, we think that those are both compelling reasons. And I think site design and even aesthetics um, are, are what the, the board should rely on. Well, if I may speak you know, to the site design, if you're a member, you know, I had met with the neighbors, um, one of them was here tonight, and talked about designing so we could save some mature maple trees that are currently giving them some shade protection, you know, from the buildings there and anything that goes on there. So the one island that we have um, in between that the upper part right there, mm -hmm. there's like a 24 inch maple tree there. And that, you know, gives shade to the property to the uh, west. Then on the north end of the parking lot where I think we talked about that 112 foot light pole is, mm -hmm. um, that gives the shade and so forth to the house directly to the north. Mm -hmm. And that fence that's actually shown there is, is installed. We put that in last week. So that white fence, the six and a mm -hmm. six foot high white uh, vinyl fence that now comes around the corner and they like the way that looks. It gives them kind of a sense of a more private yard. So that's, you know, part of the, the design aspect too. Jack. Uh, you mentioned you have uh, excess parking on the neighboring lot that you manage as well. Is there a path that would be available in terms of being able to walk uh, if that is overflow parking? Is there? Well, a, yeah, they currently do walk. They walk like, you see the existing sewer line there in front of that building? Right there. They walk right down the sidewalk there and then right along where the drain is right there, and they go right to the bus stop. Um, they've kind of created a path there. I don't provide a path there. You know, kind of like cows Cow go path pasture to get. Yeah. Well, I figured there was something yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, but yeah, I guess they can certainly park next door if I have the spaces. But I don't want to say yes, you can park over there. Right. It's actually worked out this past winter. For big snowstorms, I have my tenants from High Street parking a lot that's currently on 462. We clean everything up. So I see that, you know, happening in the future with both properties also just, you know, for snow management. Um, I will bring up the, um, how you had gone to the uh, Historical Commission and um, they deemed the I don't know, shed or sure. barn, whatever yeah. it is, historical. <clears throat> so they did put a 12 month delay on it, but they said that the delay could be lifted sooner if you um, come up with alternatives to why it's, or why it's not feasible. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not our jurisdiction, but I just want to say that if whatever gets changed on the plans would have to come back here. Of course. Especially regarding the parking. Of course. Yeah, and Mr. Robleski had been through, the, before the last time we were here, Mr. Robleski had been through the Historical Commission and they waived demolition delay because they found that the building was not significant. Hmm. Fast forward 15 months without anything materially changing, they have now found that it is significant. Yes. It was only 15 months ago? No. Or June 12th of wow. uh, 2018 was the hearing. Oh, I didn't realize And that. yeah, they deemed it not significant at that point and did not put a one-year delay. Hmm. So now there it is. Oh, I had no idea. All right, so as long as you know that. Um, yes. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, at this point, I was going to open it up to public comment. Is there anyone here? Who has any questions for this? I, I nope. Someone just got. Um, nope. No questions. Okay. Um, so, Chris, at this point, I have a list of possible conditions, and I don't know if you've added any more. But um, having not done this before, do I go through each question and just solicit comments from the board if anyone has? Please. So um, staff came up with um, some suggested conditions for you that are based on other projects that we've done in the past. I did review them with the building commissioner 
Um, and I think they're, the conditions are in your packets, the ones that were mailed to you. And you could go through those one by one and decide whether you think those are appropriate or not. Um, another thing you could do is um, just kind of put this public hearing on hold and go on to the next one, the tree hearing, because I know there are a lot of people here, and then go back to this one. I think it's going to take you a while to go through the conditions. That's exactly what I was thinking. And then you're also going to have to go through your site plan review criteria um, in 11.24. Exactly. Yeah. So there's kind of a lot of work that still needs to be not done on this project. And um, you know, if you think you can put this one on hold and go to the tree hearing and get through that quickly, you can come back to this. I'm just suggesting that as a possibility. I agree. And do I go through the conditions first or go through the um, the other list, which do I do first? Sometimes yeah. if you go through the criteria, it elicits new conditions. I mean, you can do it either okay. way. Okay, that's, either all way. right, we'll do the criteria and then we'll do conditions. All right, so um, because we have a room full of a lot of people who I know who are waiting for the tree hearing, I have to maneuver you guys around again. I'm so sorry, thank you for your continued patience, but um, so work, do I have to take a, make a motion to put the, Public I think hearing on you hold, or can could I take a motion to suspend the to suspend until later this evening and come back to it later in the evening. Can we do a, um, and it's okay for our architect to leave. Hmm? Is, is our, our our architect can leave. We don't need to. I don't know if there's going to be any other questions. Let me. For her. Are there any <laughs> other questions for the architect? <laughs> I see none. Thank okay, you so thank much. You. So, yes, this is not so much a question as it is a comment. Um, and I want, to, I want to commend the architect and the developer for creating a project which beautifully fits into the existing landscape uh, and provides, in my view, all of the aesthetic issues, it solves all of the aesthetic issues that infill development raises so often in this town. And I think this is an excellent example of uh, developing more housing at a scale that is appropriate to the neighborhood. And I think the two principals should be commended for this. Thank you. Yes, Janet. Uh, my math was wrong. So the 32 spaces fits in very nicely with the exception about the use. So I, I, don't, I shouldn't do this on the fly. So I, I don't think you have to reach to compelling reasons. So. But I agree with the remark that this is a very attractive po project. I appreciate that. That the packet was very well prepared. Right. Okay. Thank we'll you. We'll see you later. So, <laughs> do you, someone want to make the motion? Move to, con to continue suspend the hearing. To suspend later. the hearing to later in the day. Second. Second. Yeah. That. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Great. Uh, unanimous. Okay. So, let me just organize my papers for a moment. Yes. It's this, they gave them to us, it's this thing. And it's a two-sider with lots of writing. Oh, Mr. Snow. Eek. We do have a preamble for this public hearing. Do you have a copy uh, of it? I have that, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna start the next hearing in accordance with the provisions of MGL, Chapter 40, 5C, Scenic Roads, and Chapter 87, 3, Shade Trees, this joint public hearing between the Planning Board and the Tree Warden has been duly advertised in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and posted in Town Hall. Mm, so, scenic road tree removal for construction of a mixed-use building and site improvements in the town right-of-way. 133-143 Southeast Street, map 15C, parcels 3 and 4. The public shade trees impacted by this project include the following sizes. Uh, six 18-inch arborvite, 
Arborvitae on the northern property line, one 42-inch catalpa tree, um, one 24-inch spruce, uh, one 22-inch spruce that is dead, uh, one 14-inch crabapple tree, and one 6-inch elm or hickory, and one swamp white oak to be transplanted by the town. Several large oaks and a red maple on the southern edge that might have impact to roots as a result of grading. Uh, yes, Chris. I have some photographs of the trees if you wanted to look at them now or we can look at them later. Uh, can I just ask if there's any board disclosures? No, I see none. Uh, sure. These are photographs that were taken over a period of time. Um, the ones without any leaves on them for the catalpa were taken last spring. And then there are some more close-up photographs that were taken recently of the, um, the cavity in the uh, catalpa tree. We also have some photographs of the spruce trees, spruce tree. And these were sent to you earlier today. So I'm just going to run through them quickly. And then perhaps um, there may be a presentation by someone in the room. <clears throat> Could you hit the? Expand square so they're bigger. There you go. That's better. So this is the catalpa in front of um, the building that's directly behind the Florence Savings Bank, taken from different angles. This is the cavity in the tree where the three main branches come together. I'm sorry if I jumped ahead of Mr. Snow. He may, may have been the better person to give this presentation, but I just wanted to show you these pictures. It's good to see them, because then we know we can refer back to them, and it won't be the first time. So these are the ones that were taken more recently. This is the crotch of the tree. And this is down into the crotch of the tree. And you can see the tree is split, splitting. It's being held up by cables at this point. This is one of the really beautiful big branches. So I think that's the end, end of the catalpa. Is that right? No, this is taken from the property line, looking directly down the south down the property line. And you can see one of the cables has disengaged. Um, but there are more cables holding up the branches. And I think that's it for the catalpa. And then we have a couple of pictures of the spruce. Let's see, how do I get back there? What is it, the spruce? And this spruce is described by Mr. Um, Snow. He'll describe it later as being a healthy, mature spruce tree. But um, he did note at one point, or somebody noted that it has a split trunk. So this is a close up, and this is what it looks like from a distance. So I will um, cede my time to Mr. Snow. Excuse me. Welcome. Hi, um, Alan Snow, Tree Warden. Um, the uh, board was, I believe, sent the uh, um, memo I sent out today about the uh, condition of the current condition of all the trees, if you want to refer to that. And I just want to ask, how many members of the board were able to visit the tree? Just about everybody. Great. Thank you, Maria. Um, you haven't uh, been at any of the site visits? Oh. Okay. Um, so the, the pictures are going to be very helpful if you want to go into more detail about the condition of the trees. Um, again, the blue spruce, which is under up on the screen right now, um, no race spruce, excuse me. The um, does have uh, it's it's one potential defect is a uh, a co-dominant stem, uh, where the two you know um, terminal buds have grown in two competing leaders that are quite long, and those are historically you know the weak uh, link in a in a spruce tree like this of this size. And the, there were there was another spruce tree in front and one behind as well, um, sort of east and west of that tree, that also have already failed. Uh, so um, it's a very tall uh, specimen with a lot of sail that is above the existing tree canopy around there. So it tends to catch all the wind. Uh, 
let's see. Do you want individual questions on each tree or wait till the end? Okay. Right, Janet. You can go tree by tree. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it better for um, the spruces to be together? Like, is it at risk because it's exposed or is it tougher, tougher life for it? So um, trees, generally, when they're grown together, like in a stand, a, tree, a, a grove of trees, they do protect one another, and they do force the tree to grow uh, sort of s straight up to compete for light. Mm -hmm. So it reduces the likelihood of having these co-dominant stems and things like that. Um, Open-grown trees, you know, historically develop wider crowns uh, because there's less competition for light, so they tend to fill out much wider than they would in a forested situation. Chris? I thought it might be helpful if Mr. Snow um, either read or summarized his whole memo and um, described each tree and what's going on with it. And then if you had questions, then I think okay. then everybody would know they'll, be, they'll all be on the same page. Sure. All right, so the, uh, we'll start then with the catalpa, the 42-inch uh, catalpa in its current condition. Um, Generally, the tree itself is the, the crown, the leaves, the twigs, the buds are healthy and growing. Uh, they don't appear to have any major, you know, insect disease problems that would be detrimental to the health of the tree. So the living photosynthesizing tissue of the tree is, is quite healthy um, at this point in time. Um, it had a nice flower this spring, as is evident by the abundant yeah. seed pods everywhere. So, um, the main leaders of the tree um, all have significant decay um, that have open cavities. So it's not like a, a cavity that you see a bird coming out of that is walled off uh, with a small opening. These are wide openings that run you know, for feet along the trunk or the leader of each leader. Um, and uh, the decay is quite extensive in there. Two of the, um, all of the leaders of the tree have been cabled back to the center, central leader of the tree. Um, that's a common practice to support the uh, more horizontal branches. Um, two of those cables have failed already. So they they've, were installed either so long ago that the wood around it has rotted or the cable material itself has failed. And, they're just hanging in the tree right now, not supporting anything. Um, uh, the main stem of the tree, well, I'll back up. Um, the, uh, the decay in the leaders um, continue from the leader down into the branch attachment point. So for each one of these leaders or branches attached to the tree, um, the decay continues into the stem through the branch. So the main trunk, so the, the decay is continuous all the way to the ground level in the tree. Um, so it's missing a lot of its holding wood. Um, let's see. Uh, the main stem, again, um, has the same irregular cavity with openings um, that you can literally reach down into, and I did. Um, to determine how much holding wood there was left in the main stem. Um, so the, each branch is sort of open to the air where it attaches to the main trunk. It's, it's very interesting. It has a lot of characteristics, uh, a lot of character, excuse me, uh, for an old tree. Could I say, Pam, could we put the, one of the photos up of the tree, the, the, or the Catalba tree instead of the spruce, just so people aren't, Or Chris, maybe even the one that shows this, the, the crotch of the leaders. We refer to it as the branch attachment point. The branch, att okay, I was following the director of planning. So, okay. <laughs> the spread. Yeah, so right there, that is where two of the main leaders um, come down and, and attach to the trunk of the tree. Um, and you can see that they're not physically attached to one another. Um, and they move almost independently of one another. 
and the other leaders of the tree. So, and there, um, again, I did climb up in there and I dug down with my hands um, to find out how far, there was so much organic matter in there, it was impressive. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, to find the sound, the sound wood that is in there. Um, and that continues up, so I can literally stick my hand up into that central leader right there. Um, that goes about six or seven feet up into the main leader. And so that would be, the, if you backed up one more photo, that would be an example of um, the bottom side of the branch or leader. And that would be the good hold, that's where the, the holding wood is right now. Um, that's where the sound wood is located in, the, in that particular trunk branch connection. And again, you can see there you have lar long lateral branches and then uh, more upright leaders. Um, the um, leader that goes off to the left there heads directly towards the property. Um, that particular leader there will need significant pruning in order for the building to be built because it grows well over the property line onto private property. So physically, in order to build the building, we'd need to remove about 20 feet of that leader right there, the branch. Um, so um, in discussing um, you know, tree, arborist tree uh, people, uh, tree wardens, you know, we're always, we're, we're doing risk assessments on everything we look at, and we do it all day long. Um, so risk requires um, there to be something there that you, you don't want to be damaged. Uh, it could be a car, parking lot, a house, pick tables, people walking on the street. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a normal level of risk we accept in everyday activities and in, in trees and in everything. Um, the, uh, the risk changes as you begin to add defects, uh, known defects in the tree. So you have, uh, you know, it could be that co-dominant stem I was talking about in the, in the spruce. It could be um, the cavities in the leaders. It could be the cavities in the trunk. Um, you know, multiple things uh, add up to um, determine the likelihood of failure. And once something fails, what is the target? Um, currently, under the current use, sort of land use there, the target potential is, is relatively low because the property really isn't being utilized and it hasn't been um, you know, actively utilized in, in a while. I'm not quite sure how long, but um, so the, the actual risk right now of something failing and hitting somebody or something um, is relatively you know, low to moderate. Um, and that risk could be mitigated by installation of new cables, bracing, or um, pruning to help reduce that risk even further of something failing. That's assuming that you know, we don't change the land use around the tree. Again, this is just the assessment of current conditions. Can you hold your questions till later? Thank you. Um, I'll answer that question at a later date. Don't, don't let me forget. <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously, so if, those, if the land use changes there, which it's intending to, that form is going to change quite a bit. Um, and in order to make the tree, um, to mitigate that risk, some of the common practices that are done is to do exclusion zones where you physically put up a barrier to stop people from going underneath the tree. This is done with historic trees and significant trees um, all the time. Um, and, you know, whether it's an appropriate use for this particular situation or not, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. Um, the um, other thing you do is the bracing of using physical structures to support the weight of the branches and then cabling again and doing things like that to 
support the tree um, to keep it growing and reduce, reduce the risk of failure. Uh, so the, the, the spruce tree we already discussed, uh, the one you know, risk factor in the tree is the codominant stem, um, which again could, could be mitigated through cabling or bracing. A 14-inch multi-stem crab apple appears to be a healthy crab apple. Uh, like most crab apples, it's full of, full of um, water sprouts and suckers and needs a lot of pruning um, to get it back into shape. Uh, the arborvitae, um, you know, it's, it seems to be a typical arborvitae head that, hedge that is getting mature. Um, and uh, doesn't appear to be anything necessarily wrong with it, with it at this point in time. Like, um, there, was, there are other trees on the list that we're not requesting any kind of, really don't require hearing. The dead spruce tree uh, that was snapped off doesn't require a tree hearing. It you know, just needs to be removed. Um, there's also another clump of um, vegetation to the south of the property um, with a dead elm tree in it. Uh, I think that was referred to as a, as a um, uh, hickory, I think maybe. That was actually a so dead a elm tree. large oaks and a red maple on the southern edge. Okay, those are, the, those are the trees that are outside the property line that are on the wood edge that if they, depending on how much they change the grade around those trees, potentially could be impacted by the construction as well. I don't believe they're on town property, they're on private property. So the adjacent, neighbor, adjacent property, so. Um, Mr. Snow, are you going to mention or talk about your recommendation options? Yes, if you'd like me to do that now, I will. Sure. Okay. Um, so um, my recommendation option for the Catalpa would be to, um, based on knowing the type of construction that's going to take place there, what it would you know, involve to try to preserve it without a guarantee that actually would preserve it for a significant amount of time, um, would be to uh, permit removal of the tree with full replacement value. Um, uh, my you know, not preferred option probably would be to the, do the exclusion zone and the, the uh, retaining wall and the bracing and the cabling and the pruning um, to try to preserve the tree with no guarantee that we would succeed in doing that. Um, the spruce tree, 24 inch spruce tree, I recommend removal and replacement value. Uh, based, uh, replacement value is based on $90 per inch of diameter of breast height. So that replacement value would be $2,260. The Catalpa would be $3,780. Um, crab apple, um, I recommend removal uh, with full replacement value, $1,260. And um, Arborvitae, again, um, recommend removal with replacement based on um, sort of in-kind replacement. So we'd be getting six new bald and burlap arborvitaes that are six feet tall um, or the value thereof of those trees. It's difficult to do a DBH on a arborvitae. So. Chris, do you have anything to add? Um, the only thing I have to add is that um, in order for the trees to be removed, both the tree warden and the planning board need to um, make a recommendation that the trees be removed or need to agree that the trees are going to be removed if one or the other um, does not decide to uh, agree with that, um, then the trees cannot be removed. Um, but we have received, uh, so, so if the planning board and the tree warden do agree that the trees can be removed, We've received two letters of opposition from uh, residents, so now 
um, even though the planning board and tree warden would agree that the trees can be removed, the decision would go to the town manager. Um, we, we've checked this with our town council, um, Joel Bard, and town attorney, Joel Bard, and he has stated that um, the decision would go to the town manager. So that would be the procedure that you and the tree warden would make your decision, and then if you agree that the trees would be removed, then the town manager would also need to weigh in on the decision. So we go through our process and then we will take a vote. Am I to understand that the statement that Mr. Snow just made and his document that we've been provided, is that the, so he's made his recommendation? Correct. Okay. All right. So that would be to remove all of the trees. Um, I, and maybe either of you can answer this. So when I add it up, it's $7,200, which is a significant amount of money. And I was wondering what happens to that money and if any of that money could be um, funneled back into any of the trees that would be the replanting of trees. You know, there's standard trees we use. I know Mr. Snow, but, you know, would it be possible to get a special tree or something to sort of start anew? Um, so the money, uh, this goes into the tree uh, gift fund. All, this, all the replacement value assessed value on trees goes into the tree planting fund. So um, that money is specifically to purchase new trees to be planted around town. Um, and do either of you have any thought that it just goes into that catch-all or could it be applied back to where the trees were taken? So the, um, the applicant has a planting plan um, already involved in that. So the funds would go to I mean, not that we couldn't plant trees there, but there is a planting plan um, for this project to, uh, to put back into the public way uh, when these trees are removed. So the money would be used separately. Because the landscaping plan that will be provided by the developer, he's paying for those trees. Correct. Well, do you impact choosing them, or is that just what the developer comes up with? I'm uh, saying this because it's public way. We should make that clear. That the area we're talking about is actually town land. Correct. So the tree warden is required to, to uh, um, approve all tree planting in the public way. Okay. So opening it up to the board, um, questions about the trees. Jack? Uh, I was just wondering how old the tree is and, and is there uh, some history with regard to the care of it over the years with the cabling, who did the cabling, um, things like that. Um, I do not know the history of the tree. Um, it, does, it is an old tree, there's no doubt about that. Catalpas do grow relatively fast and they, they tend not to live really long lives, but um, mm -hmm. They're, they tend to be a fast-growing, weak-wooded tree in general. Um, but obviously they do, they can live for quite a long time. Um, as far as the cabling goes, I'm not sure if those cables were installed by the town. Um, I, I believe the property owner may have actually paid for the installation of those trees in the past, but uh, the cabling of those trees in the past, but he can clarify that okay. um, at some point. So this tree is like a super senior tree. I guess in tree age, yeah, it, it's, it's getting up there. Hmm. Janet. So just to clarify, um, all these trees you're describing are healthy and the catalpa is old and kind of full of holes but is still blooming. And so are you res recommending removal because you don't think they're going to survive the construction project? Or I didn't really understand, like, they're all healthy recommending approval. Like, what's the next, what's the missing step in that? That's a very good question. The, so it is because the, the project that has been proposed is to change the grade significantly by feet around uh, most of these trees, by several feet. Um, and you know, most trees can't tolerate the, the grade change of even an inch of soil or two inches of soil, definitely. Um, but by changing the grade of soil, you suffocate the roots, essentially. Um, they can't get oxygen and they, they die, and the tree dies shortly thereafter. Um, so, yes, I, 
I do not see how, um, if the great changes are going to happen on this project, that these trees can survive. Um, Any other questions? Jack? Um, I was interested the, if you read uh, the risk assessment report by McCarthy and, and do you have an opinion yeah. uh, on that? I know, I know you spoke to uh, risk assessment in your own uh, voice there, but is, this, is that a good report, you think? Overall, I think it is, a good, it, it is a good report. It does point out all of the, you know, all of the, you know, um, obvious issues with, with the trees that are in question. M most of them are, you know, normal sort of tree conditions that, you know, can be mitigated. The catalpa is the one tree there that happens to be, you know, the biggest tree and also happens to have you know, the most significant uh, the issues with it. Um, one of the things I didn't go into um, that the, um, report didn't cover was I did, I did do a resistograph of the tree, which is a tool that can be used to measure decay in wood. Um, and the, um, the tree essentially has between, um, let's see, make sure I get this right, seven to, seven to 11 inches of holding wood. So it's healthy wood that goes around the circumference of the trunk. So. Um, out of a, um, you know, a 42 inch tree, there's roughly you know, six to 11 inches of sound wood there. Um, and that's not uncommon you know, in old trees. In this particular tree, you can actually see it though because it, it's of the open cavities. You can look down <clears throat> into the trunk and see the decay. Jack? So is that uh, more than half the diameter then? of the tree that is uh, not healthy or, yeah. or is a cavity? Yes. Although the top is a beautiful tree now, my understanding and my observation is that it's structurally unsound um, and that whether that occurs tomorrow or in, you know, sometime in the future, it's hard to know, but with the proposed change of use and the increase of, of traffic and, and increased use, that risk in the level significantly changes. Is that a fair you know, summary of, of your assessment? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very good summary. Janet. Would your um, recommendation change or be affected by if it was a historic tree, like say Harriet Tubman had given a speech under the tree, like would that affect or have an effect on you? Or I mean, I don't think that's true here, but I'm just wondering what the factors are. Um, yes. Um, I mean, I think I've, I've tried to be very fair in my assessment of the risk and in the, in the ways that we can mitigate risk. Um, so if, it, if the tree has a higher, let's just say, social value to it, you know, historic value, um, that generally means that we're willing to spend more money on preserving it. We can, we can put as much money as you want into something to preserve it and keep it going. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the ability to do that within reason um, is what we're trying to, I'm trying to balance. So on that line, if you were trying to preserve it, you have, if we have three feet of fill coming in, you have to build a retaining wall to hold back that three feet of soil. And you're saying the drip line, so that's like the outer edges of where the branches are, which is huge. <laughs> and then you'd also have to put bracing under the vertical leaders and then now your retaining wall is over 30 inches high and it's in a public park, so you might have to have fences. So this, this could run into some significant money if, if that was the, and then a part of one of the leaders could break and then all that 
I mean, then you just have a broken tree in the middle of a, yeah. Correct. Yeah, correct, okay. Are there any other questions from the, oh, Michael? From the picture we're looking at now, uh, the tree appears to be kind of out of balance because of the long leader, which is the leader which goes into where the building is proposed to be constructed. Is that right? Um, the, the photo does appear to show that, but you're not, if you saw a photo of it in leaf, uh, as it is now where it was earlier this summer, um, it actually has a very uniform crown. Um, well, I'm not so much thinking about the crown as I am about the supporting architecture of the tree. It, I wonder whether it, it pruning, eliminating that long leader and allowing the rest of the tree to exist as it is would help the, the life of the tree that remains or whether that would be a, a useless kind of operation. It seems to me that the, the shape of the tree, the shape of the tree without that a uh, leader is perfectly adequate as a tree. Um, and I understand that the crown fills out completely, uh, but I'm wondering if that would be a way to help preserve the tree, uh, to remove it from um, impinging on the development uh, and uh, extending the life, as extending its life. That's another great question. The, um, so, I mean, old trees, uh, have a hard time balancing their their living tissue and and all their supporting you know wood and everything. So it's it's a it's a very delicate balance in old trees um, as it gets as is with some humans as we age that um, you know they actually really need all of that. And so if you start reducing the crown or removing large portions of healthy leaders you're going to really disrupt the, the available nutrients to keep that tree in the delicate balance that it's in right now. It's, right now it's, it's growing, it's putting on new healthy tissue, um, and it, it's decaying. So it's a race between the decay and the new wood as to you know, who's gonna win, and as we all know, um, the decay is going to win eventually. So, um, but we don't know exactly when that's gonna happen. So. Thank you. Um, there's a picture showing the, the property line running down that west property line. So thinking of what Michael was saying, if, if that was cut, there's other parts of the tree that still have to be cut on the west side um, because they extend over the property line. Um, yeah, so the property, like where you see the broken um, cabling, the line actually goes sort of at an angle, so it's probably mid-center of the photo there and sort of heads off um, to that back fence way in the back. So um, there's other parts up here that would have to be cut too. Any other questions from the board? Okay, so at this point, um, could I see a show of hands of how many people here would like to speak on or have questions of the tree issue? One, is that it, or two? Okay, um, would you like to come forward and thank you, and just state your name and great. I'm Henry Lappin, I'm the chair of the Shade Tree Committee. Um, we voted in favor of preserving the trees, particularly this tree, because of the significance. You know, these are public shade trees. This is a tree that's owned by the town in the public right of way. Um, I appreciate what the developer is trying to do, but there is a taking here. So this tree may die soon, but it could live quite a long time. I talked to Alan about this in, at length. We don't know, of course, but it could live for decades. You know, it is healthy. It's got a nice canopy. So that's why we voted in favor of trying to preserve the tree. And if there's anything that can be done to preserve it, I think it'll be a big loss for the street and for the town to lose that tree. So that's all I want to say. Thank you.
Yes, if you'd like to come up and just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Charles McCarthy. I wrote the tree risk report for Amir. And I, uh, I somewhat agree with Alan on, on the Catalpa, Catalpa tree. Uh, no, there is a, there are defects all through the different uh, uh, leaders of the tree. If you could move the mic just a little closer. Is the light on? Yes. Yeah. Is it better? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so besides the main trunk having a, having a hollow trunk, and uh, uh, I know Alan did a resistor graft test on the trunk, uh, if you go up those large leaders, they all have cavities that are uh, pretty large defects, making the tree very susceptible to failure. Uh, particularly in uh, wet snow or ice storms. And as, the, uh, as far as the health of the tree, you want to look at it in two different ways. You can have a healthy tree in that we're getting foliage and growth every year. But you can have a tree that is highly susceptible to failure because of past storm damage, which are basically resulting into these cavities that we have throughout the tree. So we can have a tree with green leaves, but a tree that is highly susceptible to failure. And I think at this stage, uh, the tree is highly susceptible to failure. Uh, and uh, that's about all I have to say about it, I guess. Uh, Do you want to speak on the spruce while you're up here? Uh, the spruce, yeah, in the report I wrote about the three spruce because it's, it's kind of interesting where you had a, a dead spruce, a, uh, a standing butt log from a failed spruce, and a stump from another spruce that had failed before. And so the middle spruce, the remaining one, had uh, a very tall tree that, er that went into two liters. I want to say the liters might have been 45 feet off the ground by memory. Now, if you could look at the two leaders, how they originated was more than likely storm damage many years ago. And then we had response wood, which ended up with two co-dominant stems. And I think those two co-dominant stems are highly likely to fail again. And uh, so, in my opinion, that would be a... Uh, uh, probably tree could be taken down because of that, but if you were going to in install support cables, a support cable between the leaders between those two stems, you still have the issue if the grade has changed, uh, would that affect the health of the tree? And I, and I think it would, so it's, uh, but that one there was kind of an interesting, interesting three trees to look at. You had the, you had two failures and you had the remaining tree that's left with a uh, with a leader that's susceptible to fail with two leaders that are susceptible to fail right now. So uh, I don't know if you had a question on that. Uh. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Amir Mikchi. I'm the owner and the developer for that site, 133, 143 South East Street. Uh, you ask uh, who maintained those cables and who took care of this tree. It was me all these uh, years that you know I did take care of this. And uh, you can ask uh, Berkshire Design Group, my dear friend Mike Liu, that is here, that in the very beginning, uh, that was my intention to save these trees, and you know, because you know, I wanted to, and I told him that you know, they have a good, nice character, and like to keep it, and that's why we hired uh, uh, Charles uh, to basically come and give us assessment, and the assessment was that you know, this is there is a serious issue, and the t and the seriousness of it is that. Right now it is vacant. It has been vacant for three years, this, and nobody travel, goes there. But once you have people going there, then you know, we are talking about the risk, and then uh, what is gonna happen if you know, one of these branches would fail. Another thing is that many years ago, when the, in the town decided to have a village, business village center in town, they decided to have this east side 
to be developed, and I promise that I will do that. And, uh, but the thing is that no matter what kind of development we are going to have, as Alan uh, rightfully said, even if you would have two inch or, uh, of the filling there, it's going to bond to kill this tree, no matter what, regardless of what the project is, regardless of what the development is. And if you want to have a nice plaza, we look into every possibility. And uh, there is only, there is one way we can, you know, uh, uh, to save the trees that we have to put the, uh, build a wall, three feet wall. And once we build the three uh, feet wall, then the question is that, you know, if somebody is going to fall into the pit, then we have to create, to put a cage. So we are really going to ruin the, just the atmosphere. What I mean, it's not going to be inviting place to have a tree with a cage, and then around that, you know, with the three feet, you know, if you really look, it's already low, you know, and you know, and then having three feet of uh, wall and then the cage around it, just you know, trying to look to it. It's really not something that, you know, uh, I, I do admire, I do my best to uh, take care of the trees. In fact, you know, I'm uh, create, I got another consultant to create, you know, uh, a rain garden, you know, in Hadley as my other properties are. And even in Amherst, right, you know, by the auto expresses that, you know, uh, Mr. Root is, you know, coming up with the way to do it. But it is really something that, you know, it has to be appealing, something that to be nice, and also making sure that it will be safety, that the safety of the public is preserved. That is basically why I ask that, you know, you, you will allow the removal of this tree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other um, questions from the board? So... Yeah. Oh, yeah, Michael. Um, I'm curious, uh, the uh, chairman of the, uh, of the Shade Tree Commission uh, suggested that the commission uh, was opposed to the uh, removal of these trees. Uh, can you tell me whether that was a unanimous vote on the part of the commission or whether there was some dis dissension among the members of the commission about this issue? I don't remember exactly. Um, I think um, it was a smaller group, but we all agreed. I think it was unanimous among the smaller group. One person had to recuse himself because they worked for Berkshire Design, and um, I think one person wasn't there, so there were only four of us at that time. So. Follow-up question, and was that vote on voting for saving all the trees, or did you vote on the individual trees? Um, I think we voted on saving all of them, but in the thing we wrote, which I don't have with me, unfortunately, um, we were focused mostly on the catalpa tree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? So at this point, do we have to make a motion and make a decision? Um, unless anyone has any more information they need or thoughts. Um, do I hear a motion? Anyone want to make a motion? I know it's could a hard I, thing. I, I'd like to ask a procedural question. If we make a motion, then do we discuss it? We make a motion, someone seconds it, and then, and then we have more discussion, okay. and then we vote on it. I move to, to I move that the planning board accept the recommendations of the tree warden and for the removal and the compensation for all of the trees, regrettably, including the Katal. And to close the public hearing. And to close the public and to close hearing. The, close the what and close the public hearing. Oh thank you. Second. Okay. So um, are there any other questions or discussion before we vote? Maria did. Michael? Yeah, I'm, um, moved by the notion that, uh, 
this tree is public property and that our appointed commission in charge of such property is in favor of retaining it and of not allowing it to be uh, taken down. Um, it's a duly, a duly appointed body of the town and uh, I think we need to give it weight. Uh, on the other hand, our tree warden, who is also a duly elected or a duly appointed member of the, of the town's uh, governing body, uh, has the opposite opinion. Um, I don't quite know how to, how to come down on this. I, I can understand, I, I think I understand both points of view. Um, and um, I am fairly certain that this uh, issue is driven by the proposal to construct a property behind the land on which this tree is located. If such a proposal were not uh, in the offing, uh, there would be probably no issue. Um, so that could that uh, makes a, an even greater conflict here. It seems to me that uh, we're being asked to provide uh, development opportunities at the expense of uh, an, an environmental asset of the town. Uh, and I am uncomfortable with doing that. Um, recognizing that the area in question is uh, earmarked by the town for development, uh, and also um, recognizing that, um, well, I, that, that's, that's enough, I think, on that issue. Uh, so I'm not, I, I, I think I'm going to vote uh, uh, no on this uh, motion um, because I believe we're really taking something away from the town that it it owns and it values and it could continue to value for a number of years although there's as Mr. Snow points out there is certainly no guarantee as to the, its longevity but um, I, I, th I think it deserves a chance. Maria. Um, I think that's a very good point, Michael, in, in that we're also a duly appointed board to look at things from the perspective of, through a planning lens. And um, we have to look at the context and we have to look at the bigger good. And you're right, this is taking, but this project is also giving back something very significant. We're so desperate in need of housing and diversity and densities and areas that we've earmarked as village centers. And I think that the amenity of this project, in this case, if we look at it from the master planning perspective, is something that is gonna be very valuable for the town. Um, it's in a perfect location, it's at a bus stop, it's gonna promote more walking, more liveliness in other areas of town. So if we take a step back and look at the weight of the two trees that are in most contention, and then look at how this would impact a serious issue of that we've seen come to this board over and over, and you know well, of our need for housing, I think that we need to weigh that in the perspective of the planning board. So you're absolutely right. Everyone serving on boards are putting their opinions about what they're sort of focusing on. And I think as planning board members, we look at it in that sort of lens. And so um, I kind of agree and disagree, so. <laughs> Jack? Uh, I just want to say that uh, we heard from two experts and uh, that, that says a lot to me in terms of uh, the right decision in terms of preserving the trees or not. Mr. Snow. I just want to comment that on both of those, um, both of those comments and, and I understand, I mean, I don't take this decision lightly in, in looking at a, you know, significant uh, public asset 
um, its you know its its uh, presence in that you know on that property. I mean, most people have probably driven by that tree you know a thousand times and barely even noticed it um, because it sits so far back from the public way. Um, but you know, the minute it's gone, I, I'm sure everyone's going to if it's gone. Um, that uh, people will notice that there's a void there, that this, this, something is missing. Um, and the one, the one, when I make these decisions daily, <laughs> and that, you know, I'm an urban forester, and I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the long, long goal. And our goal is to maintain a, you know, a balanced tree canopy in town, a healthy tree canopy in town, with uh, a diverse, you know, specimen and age class. So um, it's difficult to, to, to look at a tree that is as charismatic as this tree especially and um, say that, you know, maybe it's time for this tree to go so that we can start planting new trees uh, and trees that will grow to become significant public shade trees. Um, there's a lot of room on this, on this particular area to plant new trees um, and the best the best time to plant trees, as always, is you know 20 years ago. You know we sh you know we should have been planting trees um, that we can enjoy now. So we will be planting trees for the next generation to enjoy at this spot. Um. Janet. Um, so I, I have a few points just to make. One of them is that the planning board is um, making its decision under the Scenic Roads Act which is um, chapter 40, section 15C. And so that's our decision. I, I'd, like, I'd be interested in the board talking about Southeast Street as a scenic road and the impacts of removing a tree of Southeast Street. So I think that we should focus on that a bit. Um, and then um, Mr. Snow is talking about um, public shade trees or public trees under chapter 87. And so um, his decision um, since it's been, there's been a letter written, um, the select board and the mayor we'll have to make the final decision, but our decision is separate and there's no other entity in our town that could contradict it. And so there's a case on that, but I really do think we need to focus, focus on the, the, the impacts on the scenic road, Southeast Street, which I, you know, I live on, so I, I don't know if that you know, helps or hurts my case, but I think we should talk about that, because you know, it's a beautiful road, it's scenic, um, has amazing views. Um, we've protected tons of land along it, it's a priority. Um, and people enjoy it and recreate on it, and I wonder if, what's the impact of removing these trees on that. If we could talk about that and just focus on our, our statute, and not to say don't talk about the importance of public shade trees, but we talk we have like sort of parallel streams here. So, um, well, I'll say um, I have to sadly admit I probably drove by that tree hundreds of times and I never noticed it until this project came up. And I will say, looking at it, it has a beautiful form. I mean, when you get close, you see it has lots of problems, but um, just the shape of it was really something special and I wish I had noticed it long, long ago. Um, but as a planning board member and looking to the future and thinking about scenic roads and where this is, um, that's why I you know, have high hope and want to do due diligence on this will be a loss, um, but this public way looks to be greatly improved from what it has been probably ever in its existence. And, you know, counting, you know, proposed right now, there's like 12, at least 12 trees proposed to be put back. Um, with sitting areas and walking, multi-use paths. And so I, um, you know, if there's a loss of the trees, I hope it's not the same and it will take, like you, Alan said, many years for these trees to grow and, and really become special and beautiful, but I hope thought goes into what trees we plant back and not just go with, no offense, but just the regular trees that are always around town that we don't always notice. Um, Maria. Um, just looking at the town map and the zoning and the, the sparse that we're talking about is um, VC and then to its west is all education and then to the east they're currently um, Colonial Village, Colonial Village Apartments. So the scenic roads we've sort of given advice on have been sort of more rural in setting and more you know about stone walls and trees and 
those we definitely carefully preserve and, and, and look at the concept, context. And, um, you know, if someone needs a curb cut and removes one tree, we do agonize over it. And this is not quite that setting. Um, Southeast Street is beautiful when you go further north and south, but as you get closer to this intersection, I'm not sure it, the scenic part still holds. So um, absolutely, we, we, we are always, you know, careful about taking context into account, and I think this is a case where the context is a, um, a commercial and more urban setting, so even more so, you know, um, thinking about scenic roads, we, and, and we have to think, does that really apply in this situation? Um, I know a lot of people think it still does, and if you look as um, how the zoning and how we've been talking about this area and as far as Village Center, I just wonder if that is still holding in this particular context. Michael. One of the things that makes the uh, very center of town, right outside the doors of this building, wonderful is the enormous trees that are in the common, on the north end of the common. Um, so I think it's uh, not quite right to say that uh, because the Southeast Street, or the, the uh, East Village area that we're talking about is um, developing into more commercial area that uh, large scale specimen trees are inappropriate. I think they're just as appropriate there as they are in the center of, on the common outside our doors. Jack? Uh, I was just gonna say that um, I too, I don't think appreciated uh, the tree until it was presented to us uh, because of the development. Uh, the Arbor Vitae, I think, shade it from view uh, when you're on College Street, but I'm encouraged by the, uh, the landscape plan and the additional planting of trees where I think uh, there'll be more um, connection, you know, with pedestrians with the trees that will be planted there uh, than is currently uh, appreciated uh, for that stretch of property. Janet? So, so the, I, I appreciate those views because it, there is a lot to be said for that new kind of plat front area. Um, I was sort of wrestling with, you know, it's like these trees are have to go, or if this if this project is approved, because it has it, you know, it's it could you could have designed it to save those trees and not increase the height there and stuff like that. And so I sort of wrestle with this that the trees will die if we approve this project because of the way it's designed, and it could be designed in a different way to preserve the trees, like more of a, com like creating a common and things like that. So I sort of, you know, see Michael's point that we have lots of beautiful old trees on our common. We have commons all over in New England and apparently quite a few in Amherst. And so, you know, if this project was designed in a different way, it could be designed to preserve the trees and create like a place for people to sit. And so I kind of, I have to say I'm sort of seesawing back and forth. Um, it seems to me a condition for the removal of the trees would be approval of a, of a project that requires the increase in um, the grading increase and things like that, not just to say, yeah, you can take them out and the project changes or it doesn't go through. So. David? I, I <clears throat> excuse me, I think, I, I feel confident saying that any vote here is a is a vote for consideration of the the proposal and the and the the, the vision for the the property and the vision for the planning and the planning for the town. No one here is anti-tree, right? Um, it, it it seems to me that the purpose of the scenic by scenic road law is to if a, if a road is designated as scenic by a town, which these roads were done so sometime in the early 70s, if memory serves, what the law calls for is an additional level of review that's offered right here, right now, what we're doing. And, and that's, what, that's what we're meeting. It seems to me that for the, the planning board in, weigh, in balancing and weighing the various interests we have here for housing, for commercial development of a village center, 
for preserving the beauty of the landscape and the viability of its greenery and the long-term cycles of growth and decay that, that in weighing that we're performing our functions and, and that in my view, given the, you know, the beauty of the tree, but it's, mm, it's, it's state of structural, of the, the lack of integrity of it, having, you know, having admired it for years, but also and have, but being frightened of climbing on it or sticking my hand in its many gaps, um, that, that in weighing those various interests, that, that it seems to me uh, the proposal, the proposed project wants to further encourage the greening of the space as it evolves into the future. And so I would vote to, again, I, I would vote to support, uh, uh, be consistent with the uh, tree warden's recommendations. Michael. Uh, I was struck by something uh, Janet said a minute ago, uh, and um, it reminds me that this tree removal issue is entirely driven by the development existing behind it. And if the development existing behind it were to be rethought in terms of providing a backdrop for this, uh, this tree, uh, probably there would be some reduction in the number of, of apartment units uh, available, but um, that might be um, a better approach from a planning point of view, not just from an aesthetic point of view of the tree, but um, from the point of view of developing a project which is uh, both um, more attractive and uh, equally useful to the area in question. Maria. I think that's absolutely right, except that we've heard from a couple tree experts that they may not be worthwhile in doing that, but there are definitely projects where we have had them work and redesign around existing trees, and I just think that this is not one of those cases. Janet. I agree that the age of the tree and its condition is a factor for me, just in terms of, you know, how long is it going to last? And that, that looking at that tree, and it is beautiful, that really weighs on me about the age of the tree or just its um, precarious looking condition. Well, if anyone else have any more comments, or are we um, up for a motion? Well, ready, I'm sorry, vote on the, are we ready to vote on this motion? You good? Okay. Sure, that's what I'm asking. If we voted to, for the removal of the trees, it wouldn't happen unless the project was approved, right? Or would, we, would that be a condition on our motion? Actually, we make our recommendation, Mr. Snow has made his, and then it will be Mr. Bockelman who makes the final decision. Okay, because that, that, okay, that, I don't but, know if we but should. then it would become. Conditional good. on the project being, going forward? Uh, that's. Could we make the motion with that condition? I have to say, just, I, I've been sort of holding this back. There's a, there's a court case that says that the planning board is making a decision under the Scenic Roads Act and then either the select board or the mayor makes the decision under the you know public tree public shade tree act and you need approval from both you know they're not there's not one group that trumps the other and so that case was shepherdized today it has it's a it's a superior court case so it's not like an appeals court case but it does support the language of the statutes because these they each of the statutes refer to each other and they know that they operate independently right. and together so i don't this is like a legal question i think for you know our town attorney but i don't see i think we just make our decision and we yeah, have we to approve it that. and then yeah. um the town manager kind of acting as because of the mayor or, you know or a select board and the executive function makes a decision under the different act and so we could take that to 
um, boards, our council, but I don't, I did some research on that just because I was re reading a, a long treatise on land use law, and I think, well, maybe it covers this, and it did have a case on point, and so, you know, but I don't, I don't, I think, you know, if we, if the planning board approves it, and then the, um, um, Mr. Snow approves the removal, then I think we're good, or the town manager acts. Chris. I think Ms. McGowan's right that both the planning board and the tree warden need to approve this in order for the tree to come down. But even so, even if the planning board and the tree warden do agree, it still needs to go to the town manager because um, there has been a letter, to, there have been two letters of opposition issued uh, or submitted against the taking down of the tree, and that relates to the um, statute that Mr. Snow operates under. Great, thank you. So are we ready to take a vote? Okay, um, so uh, with the motion that's on the table, all that are in favor, raise your hand, say aye. aye. Um, one, two, three, four, five, um, no. And, okay, so I think we've got a 5-1. Okay, how about we take a um, break, a little break. No. 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 Amherst Media, are we still running or do you want to restart? Great. Okay. Uh, great. So I'm going to restart the meeting. It was good to have a little break after two and a half hours. Um, so we're gonna juggle a few things around here because there's no way that, for what we have on the agenda, it will take us hours. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna reopen um, SPR Southeast Street uh, Court, how, the housing, reopen it and we're gonna close it. We're gonna postpone it until September 18th. They've agreed that that's okay and we'll get them first off when we meet again on the 18th. And then we will go back to Main Street, and then we'll go to Spring Street and hopefully be done at a reasonable hour. So, so yes. Excuse me, I um, made a mistake. You already read the preamble yeah. uh, the last time around, so you don't have to read the preamble again. Good. You just have to announce that you're reopening the public hearing for uh, Emerson. It's That's not reopening. You're, re you're continuing the public hearing for uh, Mr. McChee's project, and you're going to immediately move to continue it to September 18th because of the lack of time this evening to um, reasonably consider all of these projects. And I need someone to make a motion to move it to the 18th of September. Great. I move to continue um, SPR 2019-07 and 2019-04 to September 18th. Second. Great. Um, all, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. We'll see you on the 18th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> all right. So now we'll go back to <laughs> Main Street. Which, which pile is that? Can you pass that back to Chris since that's hers? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Okay. So, Chris, do we need to reopen it? Did we, or we just suspended it, it to it. later? We just suspended it to later, so, so it's this still is open. the later. So, I, I, uh, I think they do. So, I was going to go through the criteria. Um, Is there any 
And I'll just generally say the section and the number. And if board members speak up, if you have, um, should I read the? In I don't read this. Whole thing, do uh, oh boy. No. Okay. All right. So I'll read it and just keep reading them. But if you see something that you want to speak about, like. Um, then just raise your hand or say, um, hey. <laughs> and then, so with the conditions, I'm also looking to them for agreement, right? Is this, like if you're you protesting, have yeah, yeah, when I only get to the one conditions. one that we would want added to, so when we get there, we'll say. Okay. And did we have any, do you have any other suggested conditions besides what's on this two-sided paper? Okay. All right. So um, to go through the site plan review criteria, we start with 11.24 review of criteria and design guidelines. Under the general, 11.240 general uh, 00, 00 is conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw and goals of the master plan. 01, protection of town amenities and abutting properties through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. 02, protection of abutting properties from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use including but not limited to air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. 03, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space, and amenities. Moving on to 11.241, environmental. One zero, protection of unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features. So uh, what we normally do here yes. is if we find that one is not appropriate or not um, applicable, yes. then you say that, if, if you see that one is not applicable. So just wanted to remind you of that. Say that again. What am if one of these um, criteria is not applicable to this project, you say oh. not applicable. Um, uh, I'm writing down that, you know. So these 10 was not. I don't know. Well, 10. it says scenic. It was a. S no, you're right. You're protecting the scenic house. You're protecting the historic house. So right. Because it is. had the historic commission. And, I mean, I know it's not our jurisdiction, I can, but. I can yeah. jump in. I think actually that whole part of Main Street is really beautiful. And so I think you've done a really nice job of integrating the, with the structure, the way you've kind of masked it and put it back. It, 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 when you drive up Main Street, it's just filled with these beautiful old, not all Victorian houses, but collaborate houses. And it, it looks like it fits. And so I think that is an important feature in our town. It's just, there's just a lot of beauty sure. on, our, on our roads in our town. May I say one more thing? Yes. So um, what normally happens here is you go through this list, mm -hmm. and if you think of anything, you say it. And then when I'm drafting the decision, I fill in you know, things that you've said during the public hearing that support these things that you're making, these findings that you're making. And then when you get the decision to read before you sign it, you can tell me you, know, you don't agree or you agree. That's the way we usually do it. OK, is that all right? Yes, and some of these are in here. Yes. Well, I can't, oh, I won't always remember if where these fit on. You mean the conditions? Yeah. Oh, so some, sometimes what I do is when I'm drafting the um, decision, I'll say as discussed and or as imposed by condition X, um, this condition is met, you know. Okay. So there's reference back and forth. I okay. just wanted to remind us all of that. There's a little bit of, um, license that I take, poetic license, in drafting yes. the decision, so. Thank you. 11.2411, adequacy of proposed methods of refuge disposal. One, two, ability of proposed sewage disposal and water supply systems within and adjacent to the site to serve the proposed use. 13. Adequacy of the proposed drainage systems within and adjacent to the site to handle the increased runoff resulting from the development. 14. 
provision of adequate landscaping, including the screening of adjacent residential uses, provision of street trees, landscape islands in the parking lot, and a landscape buffer along the street frontage. When a non-residential use adjoins a residential district, an uninterrupted vegetated buffer shall, to the extent feasible, be established and maintained between buildings associated with uses under this section and the nearest residential property boundary. When natural and undisturbed vegetation already exists on site prior to site preparation and clearance, the majority of that vegetation may be retained and included as part of the buffer, along with the addition of such new plantings, selective removals, and other management of site plantings as are determined to be necessary to maintaining an effective year-round visual screen. 15, adequacy of the soil erosion plan and any plan for protection of the steep slopes both during and after construction. 16, protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, and vibration through appropriate site and structure design and the use of appropriate design and materials for containment, ventilation, filtering, screening, soundproofing, sound dampening, and other similar solutions. 17, Protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking lot and building exterior lighting through the use of cutoff luminary, light shields, lowered height of light poles, screening, and other similar solutions. Except for architectural and interior lit signs, all exterior site lighting shall be downcast and shall be directed or shielded to eliminate light trespassing onto any street or abutting property to eliminate direct or reflected glare perce uh, perceivable to, uh, perceptible to persons on any street or abutting property and sufficient to review, to reduce a viewer's ability to see. All site lighting, including architectural sign and parking lot lighting shall be kept uh, extinguished outside of those business hours established <coughs> under the approved site management plan, except for light determined to be necessary for site security and the safety of employees and visitors. 18, protection of flood hazard as stated in section 3.22, considering such factors. This yes. one is not applicable. What? It's not applicable. Oh, good. Because 18 it's not is not, a, you're right, it's not, it's not flood. Great, it's not sorry, flood I was hazard. going into the trance of just like, how fast can I read? <laughs> Um, night, protection of wetlands. So 19 can be skipped. Great. And uh, historic. It's not in a historic. Uh, is it in? A okay. You may use the um, criteria of the design review board, but you did not choose to do so tonight. So you can say that you're not. That it's fine, or that you're not. That's it's fine. Not Okay, um, so 21, the development shall be reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances, and exits with surrounding buildings and development. 22, building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible the impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. 23, if there is more than one building on the site, the building shall uh, relate harm harmoniously to each other in architectural style, site location, and building exits and entrances. 24, screening shall be provided for storage units, loading docks, dumpsters, rooftop equipment, utility building, and similar features. Traffic and parking. Number 30, the site shall be designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement both within the site and in uh, relation to adjoining ways and properties. 31, the location and number of curb cuts shall be to minimize, oh, okay, shall be such to minimize turning move, uh, move, uh, movements and hazardous exits and entrances. 32, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks shall be provided in a safe and convenient manner. 33. Provision for access to adjoining properties shall be provided as appropriate. Where possible, driveways located in commercial and business districts shall be located opposite each other. 
35, joint access driveway shall, uh, between adjoining properties shall be disencouraged. We, yeah, not applicable. Uh, 36, a traffic impact report shall be required unless wavered under 11, section 11.222. Information required as part of this report shall be set forth in the rules and regulations of the planning board. 37, when a traffic import, uh, do we still have, did we, um, yeah. They the, provided an, a traffic impact statement, but yeah. it's not the same as a traffic impact report. I so I think you're going to waive the traffic impact report and accept the That's statement. Great. All right. Um, so now we'll go through the uh, possible conditions. So are we to assume that we will include it and if someone, one of the members doesn't want to include it, then they should speak up or if they want it, want it uh, tweaked or adjusted, okay? Um, and we all have found that, good. Um, and I will be watching for, Mr. Reedy, just call yeah, out sure. if you want to, um, same thing to you if you yeah. want to comment or and maybe just two more findings or like one is the so the waiver for the traffic impact like you mentioned yes. the waiver for parking under 7.9 yes and then also um, small car parking so 7.104 um, planning board may allow upon application small park small car parking spaces to be substituted for up to 50 percent of the standard parking spaces uh, we've got 14 compact spaces proposed 14 of the 32. Of the 32, yes, thank you. So that's less than 50. Less than 15, right. For up to 50% okay. of the standard. So we, should, we usually include that in a separate list. We don't usually include that as one of the conditions. Yeah, we, right, okay. But just as a separate finding list. prior to, as I was thinking, you, went, you just went through your planning board findings. I was thinking of the other two findings, the waiver and then this as a finding, and then to the conditions. I'm not trying to muddy the waters at all. Findings under those That's sections of the bylaw. Right. Yes. But the two waivers are the traffic and the parking. Yes. Okay. Question? Yes. Do, do we, does the planning board impose that as a condition? I know there's two handicap spaces. Could we impose that as a condi condi condition or is that normally done? Um, you approve the plan as it's presented to you, and that plan would include the handicapped spaces. Okay, so under general, number one, development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whenever. If you approve it tonight, it would be tonight's okay. date if you. Yes. So I have a question. Yes. I'm, uh, it's about the relationship between the site visit and the plans as submitted to the planning board. At the site visit, Mr. Roblowski um, indicated his intention, that might not be exactly the right word, or desire somewhere to both have solar panels and to have two, at least two of the spots have electrical, uh, be an electrical charging station in the, the parking spot. Is that something that is a, do, is that considered now a part of the plan submitted to the planning board, or is that a different condition that we can ask to ask to to, uh, to make a part of the the approval? Chris, it's not officially part of the submission. It was a d discussion that you had with Mr. Robleski. So, if you want it as a condition, you need to state it as a condition. So, when we get to yeah, there's some in here later. Yeah. No, not about that, but we can add it in. And, and maybe just to put a finer point on that, I think Mr. Robust, we can commit to the electric vehicle charging station. I think yeah. the solar panel, if you want to couch it as, he will attempt to do it, but I don't yeah. think he can make the representation that it will have. It will happen. But one charging station? Is well, or it's two. one station, but yeah. two, two, two spots. Yeah, precisely. So you've got that, Chris. That would be the That's a condition. That condition, and then it would be nice. Right. Solar. <laughs> Thank you. Condition that he will attempt to install solar panels if it's um, appropriate or appropriate or feasible. Feasible. Or, yeah. yeah. I think that's fine.
So number two, development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board. And I have so much paper here. Did we get a management plan? Okay, yes. thank you. I know this is an experienced landlord, so. Um, number three, upon a change of ownership, or if the property is no longer managed by John Robleski, do I say that right? Robleski. The music kind of silent. Robleski. One of those easy oh, names. Yeah. Robleski. Um, the new owner and or manager shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at the public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether the conditions of the permit are being complied with and whether any modification to the site plan review approval or management plan is required. Four, a sign plan shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval at a public meeting. Um, question, so they're improving of the light of the sign and all that, does that have to come back to us or they're good to just go do that? Because it's existing, yeah. I think they're good for the main sign, but if they add any other signs, like okay. if there's the sign for Mr. Crossman's office or any other signs like okay. that, they would have to include that in the sign plan. So we might want to add um, that the sign plan comes back um, prior to installation of signs. Prior to installation, yeah. yeah. Okay, number five, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant, exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Um, I think that was good. Six, this property shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the Amherst uh, Residential Rental Property Bylaw. Loss or suspension of a rental permit shall um, constitute in a violation of this condition. Number seven, <coughs> changes to the project and or substantial changes to any uh, approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the plan, uh, planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the substantial, um, the purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the de uh, change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimalist um, or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or the site plan review approval. Can Seven. I add, so I lied, oh, maybe yeah. I have two things. Could we add that maybe field changes may be approved by the building commissioner? Field, can field, field changes you know, it can be like approved. construction. Something like yeah. that, yeah. So we don't have to stop construction, come back before the board, make the determination that it's de minimis or not, and then go forward. So to give the building uh, commissioner some discretion just because your docket is very full. Yeah, and then it's in his court. So he makes it so that it would be the building commissioner makes a determination whether it's beyond. Why don't you use the word insubstantial? Okay. Insubstantial. In, field insubstantial. Changes may be approved by the building commissioner. Sure, is that good? Okay. Number nine, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan and once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loomed and seeded unless otherwise specified. 10, one hard copy and one digital copy of the final revised plan shall be submitted to the planning department. 11, the office space shall be available to be rented by a member of the public and shall not be used solely as the management office for the proposed mixed-use building. Twelve, shrubs and vegetation that block the site distance on the east side of the driveway entrance shall be cleared. Construction, number 12. Prior to the issuance of any building permit, a pre-construction meeting shall be scheduled with the applicant the applicant's contractor, the town engineer, the building commissioner, the superintendent of public works, planning staff, and the fire chief, and any other staff personnel that may have a role in the construction of the project. 13, a written construction fire management plan shall be submitted to the fire chief and the building commissioner prior to the issuance of building permit, of a building permit. 14, a construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting and shall cover the following items. A, construction timeline and expected completion dates for each phase. B, location of parking for contractors. C, location of on-site and off-site staging, such as for construction vehicles, including cement trucks. D, location of fencing around the construction site. E, details and locations of directional marketing and job signs related to construction. 
F, emergency contact information such as name and cell phone numbers of developer and contractor. G, information about construction signs, including advertising signs for the contractor, developer, and architect. H, the company affiliation, name, address, and business telephone number of the construction superintendent who shall have the overall responsibility for construction activities on the project site. I, proof that DigSafe has been notified at least 72 hours prior to the start of any site work. J, any other relevant information that they may request. 15. The construction logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. A, construction activity shall occur only between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday to Saturday. And B, could I, whoop, sorry, yes. yeah, could I just yeah, add, no, and, and, and Sundays if allowed by the police chief? Is that all right, Chris? Is that allowed? I have no idea. I think we have to go through the... It is allowed if it's allowed by the police chief that you have done that in the past, but you need to make the choice whether you want to do that this time. Why? <laughs> Just when you get into interior work, it's it's all interior and there's no you know noise outside, so you know electrical, plumbing, that type of thing. Construction timeline. I mean, I don't know when exactly this will start, but I can tell you from a couple of projects that are ongoing right now, there's never enough time. Um, so I think to give John the flexibility of being able to construct on Sundays, and if it becomes an issue, then I I know that. You know, Rob and Chief Livingstone will step in and say you can't do it anymore if they're getting complaints. I, I think that um, I would like to limit that to interior construction then because I think it'd be super annoying to have people drilling and doing all that thing on a Sunday. Especially at 7 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine. You got that, that's Chris? Reasonable. Okay, great. Um, B. Parking for contractors shall be restricted to the project site. And then also, so the VFW, the, right? Unless, maybe unless written consent is provided to the planning department. Unless written consent of an adjacent landowner is provided to the planning department. Is that good, Chris? Yep, okay. Which we've already done with the VFW, right? C, there shall be no parking or idling of construction trucks and equipment in any public right of way. D, any blasting or hammering of rock and material will be <laughs> to be uh, noticed to town officials and abutters 24 hours in advance and completed between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. 16, as part of the building permit application, the applicant shall provide the building commissioner the name, address, and business phone number of the project manager and on-site supervisor who shall be responsible for all activities on the project site. 17. There shall be no exterior construction activity, including fueling of vehicles, on the project site before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. There shall be no construction on the project site of the following legal holidays. New Year's Day, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst Police Department or, uh, and or inspection services. That's good. 18, the project site shall be fenced during construction. 19, appropriate measures shall be take place to control dust, dirt, debris, and construction materials on site. Water for the dust control shall be uh, trucked in from off-site. If necessary. Uh, yeah, I, I get that. 20. If necessary, add that, if necessary. Um, if ne I wasn't sure. This was a condition that we used on Beacon, but Beacon was going to have its own well, and so it might have been part of that whole thing. So um, I guess normally you do truck water in. Yeah, yeah, you hire a water truck. So do you want to let this stand as it as it is? I just I know, know with an existing building, if there's water already provided and he has it there and he can hose down to keep the dust down, then I we don't have to bring in one of those big trucks. It's just, but if not a big deal. It's, if it's part of it, um, if the water's shut off for the whole property for some reason and he has to truck it in, then I think you've got it both ways. I mean, the intent here is to obviously keep the dust down so that it's not bothering any of the, the neighbors. Right, I think you can use the water on site. It's not saying you can't. Right, as long right. as it, right. But, but if you don't have water on site, then you have to. Shall, get, right, because like, it says shall be trucked in from off site. Right. So I'm just saying, comma, if necessary, period. If okay. Necessary, then we'll bring it in. Off site, comma, if necessary. Why, yeah. why would we tell him how 
Right. Well, they, she was saying, they understand where they're going to get water. Right? Yeah. I don't see why we have to tell them to yeah. get a truck. And there's actually contract, like they just come with the water truck and this is what they do. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's just okay. standard business. Perfect, thank you. Um, 20, prior to and during construction, physical barriers shall be installed to provide tree protection along the limit of the clearing line. Erosion controls and tree protection measures shall be continuously maintained throughout the course of the construction. 21, all catch basins shall be protected from soil and debris contamination during construction and shall be cleaned at the end of construction. 22, no stumps, demolition material, or construction debris shall be buried or disposed of at the project site. 23. The town engineer and the building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. 24, the applicant shall provide as-built plans that show the building locations, grades, access ways, parking areas, sidewalks and walkways, curbing, stormwater management facilities, lighting and utilities to the building commissioner, town engineer, and to be placed with the um, with the site plan review decision in the planning department. 25, the final certificate of occupancy shall not be issued until A, a top, the final top coat of paving for all driveways and access areas, walkways and berms has been completed. B, landscaping as shown on the plan of record has been installed. And C, as built plans have been submitted to the building commissioner and the town engineer by all design professionals for the site and the building construction and have been approved by the building commissioner and town engineer. Is there anything we forgot? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? So, wait, where did we add the electric charging station? Did we add that? Okay. So that'll be in the parking in the parking section. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm jumping too many things. <laughs> would be in the general section, um, and it would say um, that the uh, site shall have two, one electrical vehicle mm -hmm. charging stations with two um, connection points. And there was another one about, um, and the developer shall attempt to install solar panels if feasible. More um, insubstantial field changes yeah. can be approved by the building commissioner and then interior construction may be allowed on Sunday if allowed by the police chief. <coughs> and the 15B, 15B, parking for contractors shall be restricted to the project site unless written consent is provided to the planning department. The additional conditions. So, are we ready to make a motion on this? Yes. What is the, mo the motion is to approve the, 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 the conditions for the project as discussed? Is that correct? So I think it's a multi-layered motion. Number one, you have to close the public hearing. Number two, you have to um, approve the project with the conditions and waivers as listed. Number th uh, the site plan review approval. And number three, you have to approve the special permit to expunge all previous special permits. And we haven't really okay. talked a lot about that, but if you want to talk about it, now would be a good time. So I think it would be under 10.33. The building commissioner's position is that because there's an existing special permit associated with this site, and it harkens back to a time when the uses on this site were allowed by special permit pre-zone change. However, even though post-zone change, they're allowed by site plan review, which is the process right. we've just gone through. Uh, the building commissioner's position is that we still have to extinguish the existing special permit. And so I think what we have to do to do that is modify the special permit to extinguish the existing special permit. 
somewhat circular, but that's where we end up. So I would suggest instead of going through all 10.38, you probably want to do 10.33, which is the modification piece. And it's it provided that the action is consistent with the purposes and intent of this bylaw and a public hearing has been held. So you've had the public hearing and we would suggest that it is uh, in concert with the purpose and intent of the bylaw specifically because the bylaw has changed to now allow it not by special permit, but by site plan review. Right. And you are in fact allowing it by site plan review. I might want to take two votes, one on the site plan review and one on the special yeah. permit. Should we do the special permit second or first? That's just the getting rid of it, right? Probably. I, Christine, I think you raised the issue about if, are there any things in the special permits that we, we might want to add to the site, the site plan review permit? Is it, do you have any more thoughts on that? I think that would take a lot of research because I haven't read all of those special permits and the building commissioner is comfortable with expunging them. You know, I read them just because I can't stop reading paper, but it, um, they were mostly about like allowing a hair salon and, or a beauty esthetician and you know, keeping them as professional offices. I think that was it. I think that was because this used to be in the RG zoning district, mm -hmm. so that was a residential zoning district and they wanted to have uses on the site that were very restricted. And now it's in the BN, which includes a lot of different uses that are allowed um, in business neighborhood. And they're all listed in the use table. So I don't think okay. that we need to get into that. So why don't we do a motion to, to is it dissolve or remove the special permits? Extinguish. extinguish. Thank you. That's the word. Extinguish. I move, I move we extinguish the existing like special permit. <laughs> Someone second? Any discussion on this? None? Okay, all in favor say, and it's unanimous. Thank okay. you. No, we only just did that. Now I'm gonna do that, but I was gonna ask one more time. Is there any public comment to this? Do you, we're good, no problem, okay. So um, then we can close the public hearing, but that can get tagged on to the next motion, right? Okay, so David, if you wanna sure. do move, your thing again. Move to close the hearing to approve the conditions as and waivers. discussed, yep. the findings and the waivers um, presented to the board. And close the public hearing. Good. Okay, good, you did that first. And, and, appro yeah, if I, and yes. approve, approve the site plan review. And approve the site plan. Most yes, the important <laughs> part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And that too. To and that too. The site plan review. And I hear a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. Uh, and that is unanimous. So thank you so good. much. Really. Thank, thank you. So much thank for you for being yeah, so you. flexible. No, great job. I know. Everything like that. It was You're disjointed. In a but thank you for waiting. Yeah, really. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just, just raise hands. All right, I'll do that. I just always think I can't, I can't see. I can only hear. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, that is a lot to read. Okay, so if I can find my agenda. So uh, Ms. McGowan was asking about her status in this since she wasn't here when this case was first heard. She is now a member of the planning board, so she may approve uh, submittals related to conditions as part of the planning board. Ms. McGowan was asking a yeah. question about that. Yep. Um, so we're going to move uh, down the agenda to uh, Section 7, Old Business. SPR 2018-16 and SPP 2018-04. Acapulago Investments LCC 26 Spring Street. Um, welcome. Thank you. If you could both introduce yourselves. Kyle Wilson from Archipelago. Dave Williams, Archipelago. Um, so I'm reading what we have here. Chris, do you want to um, give a summary of uh, their return. 
So the reason that Mr. Wilson and Mr. Williams are returning is that they are eager to get a building permit from the building commissioner. And the three conditions that they need to satisfy from the site plan review um, that they need to satisfy prior to getting their building permit are these three. So they needed to submit detailed plans and information about site improvements. It turns out they did show you the detailed plans and site improvements at the August 1st uh, meeting of last year of 2018. And I believe that um, Ms. Field Sadler has provided you with copies of those plans. Um, it just turned out that you never actually received copies of the plans. Mr. Williams brought them to the meeting, but we never actually received hard copies and we didn't receive um, electronic copies either. But now we have received them. And so um, I think it would be good if you went through the plan with Mr. Wilson and he described um, what all the materials were. And then the condition number 12 was for a complete lighting plan, a photometric plan, and details. And I understand that Mr. Wilson has a plan uh, with him. Um, I hope he does. And condition number 14 was to show the new location of the street light that is to be relocated. And I understand from talking to Mr. Wilson that he's not proposing to relocate the street light. He is just proposing to remove it because he That's feels that the lighting from the building will be adequate to um, okay. light the area. So um, perhaps he can explain exactly what materials he has here. Thank you, Chris. Um, so you have some conditions to talk about. Yes, thank you. And Chris, I plug in right here for the um, flash drive right into this. Pull this one out for the town of Amherst. hard copies of the the plans from 2018 uh, yep uh, 7 30 18 okay and I have a hard copy we have, and I'll bring it up on the screen if we have existing conditions uh, proposed site plan and the grading details <laughs> yeah Try to figure out how to get this. Uh... Hmm. I might need a little tech help on how to get into the flash drive on this. Oh, gosh. I saw pictures uh, up there earlier. You did, yeah. You, from the other people, right? Yeah. It dropped out. Techie of the day. No, we just have to find. Find you. Is it my computer anywhere? About. Go over here to the white. There you go. Yep. It sounds like your no. folder. Let's see. 
There it is. Okay. Success. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'll pull up the plans that were submitted. These are the plans that the hard copy that you have that were submitted last year. And um, the hard copy that I just gave you are, is right here. And so when we met last year, one of the questions was um, public improvements in the street and whether we were going to have street trees out front or whether we were going to have parking out front and um, what we were planning to do with the power lines that were there. So we have spent the last six months working with uh, Eversource and have come to an agreement that they are going to bury the power lines uh, along Spring Street, uh, which has moved more quickly than we had imagined, which is very positive. Um, in doing so, then, um, as you'll see here, these the little islands that, that um, are remnants from the project that the town and Amherst College started uh, about 10 years ago will go away, and these poles uh, across the front will be dropped. Uh, Excuse me, I'm sorry. Could you back up a little sure. bit and, and just restart that sentence, that back up the, relating to the project that was started 10 years ago, what's going to go away, those bump outs? I'll, and I have another image that may help. So, um, Oh yeah, that's good. Can you zoom in a little? Yeah. Oh, well, let me see if what I can do here. Bear with me, please. Can you direct? Yeah. Um, so there are uh, three poles adjacent to the site that will come down, and there's a fourth adjacent to Grace Church that's right here that will come down. Um, these three poles, A, B, and C, uh, are um, in the street, as you can see here, mm -hmm. and I'll zoom in. Mm -hmm. So um, before the crash of 08, the town and Amherst College uh, worked to regrade all of Spring Street uh, and improve the, the sidewalk. And the intent was to bury all of the utilities. Mm -hmm. So the town put all of the conduit underground. There are boxes, which you can see here, for power, cable, and telephone that were installed. And um, once the crash hit and the Lord Jeff project was put on hold, um, those plans were kind of stopped as they, as they were at the time. And the poles were left and a uh, somewhat of an accommodation was made to keep them out into the street. And so when we began the project, the intent was to try to use the new development to be a catalyst to help finish that project. And, um, and uh, that's what uh, we've been able to do. So as that relates to what we're talking about today is one of the items that, you know, this... Uh, uh, condition three was related to that previous conversation about parking or street trees out front. Are we going to have spaces? Are we going to have um, drop off? And a lot of that was obviously dependent upon whether or not there were going to be poles uh, in that street or not, because those obviously guide the, the parking layout, which is inherently inefficient because <laughs> the parking was not laid out on, or the poles were not laid out on 20 foot increments. So what we're showing here is is uh, is the uh, is to satisfy um, three and a portion of um, uh, twelve and fourteen. So for uh, condition three, what we've shown is um, on the top is of this page, which I'll go to now. So, oh. excuse me, it might be helpful for Ms. McGowan if um, Mr. Wilson were to kind of give a summary of the whole project because she's coming in not knowing anything about the project at all. And I think your page two of six, which is the second page of your little group of plans here, um, shows the plan as a whole. 
So maybe if Mr. Wilson started there and described sure. this building, then he could put the materials in context. So this is page two that you're referencing? Yep. So uh, this is the new development. Uh, this we have, there is 10 feet of grade change. So the northwest corner of the site is 10 feet higher than the southeast corner of the site. Uh, so the building has done, uh, the intent, the design of the building is to accommodate that and try to make a exterior space on the southwest corner. Um, that is commercial and uh, in the southeast corner is the lobby entrance to the building. So there are actually three different slab heights for the building. There's the lobby, there's the uh, commercial space, and then there's, uh, which includes some of the back of house, trash, electrical, fire, and then there is the residential floor. So those all step up to try to accommodate this grade that uh, that varies over 10 feet across the site. So um, we have uh, units on the ground floor, residential units on the ground floor, and then three floors of residential units above. So it is a four-story building um, that sits on this site. Um, to the southwest uh, is uh, a ramp, an accessible ramp that brings uh, folks up to uh, entrance to the commercial. It also services the side of the building. Since there is no back, this is the side. So this is trash and electrical, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the connections. And uh, that is approximately three feet higher than the lobby, which is here. There are also steps, a more direct route to another entrance to the commercial space. And uh, the lobby is directly at the grade of uh, the sidewalk. So the, um, when the project to regrade Spring Street was completed, uh, the street uh, the sidewalk uh, was pitched, uh, it was dropped, it was lowered. Uh, it was kept high up here uh, for Grace Church. There's a handicap access ramp that needed to be preserved, but, and it drops down. And uh, right here is, if I go back to this, is almost exactly where the existing drive aisle to the parking lot is. So all of those curb cuts, uh, the, two, the two cuts, this one, this one entrance and the two curb cuts are almost exactly where the proposed drop off area and uh, lowered curb uh, will be for uh, access to the building. So uh, as you'll see here, uh, that has not changed. Since last year, uh, we've been able to refine it with um, all the work that we've done in the intervening time and been able to provide all of the, um, all of the pitches, all of the spot grades, um, all of the exact dimensions um, for uh, the improvements related to that uh, handicap drop-off. So um, as you'll see here, uh, at this, this side of the site, it's at 290.9 this point and down here it is at 288.88 so um, the all of the material is uh, well let me stick with the, the grades first so this is matching the existing sidewalk obviously and as that continues there is a pedestrian ramp which will be more gracious than the one that's currently there a bit longer and have a 5.2 percent slope and then it's roughly flat here. There's a bit of a pitch. Um, and within the 2% max cross grade uh, that is allowed per ADA and AAB. Uh, and then there's a pedestrian ramp that ramps back up, which is about the same size as the existing, and uh, connects back up to the sidewalk, which continues to match existing grade here. So uh, we will be uh, keeping with all town of Amherst um, standards for the sidewalk. Uh, as you'll see here, that sidewalk is the, has the paper uh, on this side, has the, you know, the cross 
uh, pattern in the concrete and the, the, the brick colored pavers on, on, on the other side as well. So we'll be matching that. Um, this shows the, the spot grades for uh, the stairs and this shows the spot grade and the ramping for uh, the ramp up to uh, the commercial space. The ramp here is gracious enough where there is no railing. There is one railing that is here uh, as required by code um, uh, adjacent to the stairs. And this is the entrance to the lobby. Uh, what you'll see, I think it's probably more clear on the lower portion, so I'll scroll down. Uh, this, this drawing is keyed, so it calls out each of the materials. Um, it calls out where they are. Um, this is, and it also calls out um, uh, for condition 14, the uh, existing light pole, which is shown here, uh, which will be removed. That light pole is currently right here and provides some lighting to this, the, uh, the parking area as it currently stands. Uh, the, um, the parking layout as such, we have uh, with the, re this will come out with the removal of the power lines. This will come out with the removal of the power lines. And then the ability to restripe is there. Um, so the, the standard 20 foot parking spaces, we'll be able to keep this one. Um, we'll be able to add one here, I'm sorry. And then we'll be able to keep these, make them a bit tighter. And then there is an opportunity based on um, uh, how the town decides to stripe the rest of this to potentially keep those existing spaces or maybe pick one up if with the removal of this pole um, there's some additional uh, length for an additional parking space. Um, um, this is per the approved plan. So we have uh, the granite curbing that is uh, shown in front of Grace Church here, which, is, which was installed as part of the regrading of Spring Street when they drop, dropped it, uh, as, long, as well as the, the stairs that were installed in front of the, the Jones property and the stairs that were installed here at Grace Church. So um, we will be, that, that granite is going to be the same granite that we're using uh, for the, um, the number 12, which is the monolithic stone wall, and uh, the same type of granite that's used for the cladding, uh, the, the stone cladding on the face of uh, this wall and the face of the building, which was shown in the approved rendering. So none of that has changed. Uh, we have uh, uh, granite paving as well that will occupy everything on the property north of the sidewalk. Uh, that is shown on this plan here. Uh, so that also has not changed. Uh, again, this is really a, um, a clarification and a bit more detail with the more information we have uh, on what the, the front of the, the building as it addresses the sidewalk will look like. Um, Uh, if there are any questions on this, I could go into, I could answer those before I got into the lighting plan. Yes. Um, what is the depth of the landscape? Because it's a little different on the zoomed out plan than from the zoomed in plan. The depth, depth of what, this? Yeah, it looks like it aligns with the stair, like it's the full depth of the stair and the, the site plan. But then here it shows it's a little narrower. Yes. So that was a result of a code requirement to um, allow for um, access and turnaround in this location. So that line had to be reduced to meet building code. And do you have a landscape plan? Um, the landscape plan, it didn't impact the landscape sufficiently. We had shown um, um, a service berry in that paper, so in that area, so it's the it's the same landscape plan, just a slightly reduced um, uh, section there. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you uh, retrace, uh, for, for my memory's sake, the handicapped access route from the curb to the apartment building? Sure. Or the apartments. 
So uh, this is at grade. Yeah. This lobby is a lobby that directly accesses the elevator oh, okay. in the building. I've got steps there. I didn't, Those steps just go uh, to the up to the commercial space. So this is the entrance. The granite, the granite paving confused me. Yep, sorry. Yes. And the center staircase only requires one railing? Uh, the center staircase is, is a second means of access to that commercial space. Could be satisfied completely with this ramp. Okay, so that's why you have Because one. of the size okay. of the commercial. And this is also the egress path for uh, the building. So uh, that second stair that egresses the upper floors of the residential uh, comes out and drops um, to the street here. That's the one. Okay. Well, I'm very glad that the uh, bump outs are being removed and the street lights. So is there any other replacement light? Uh, I'll show you the exterior lighting. Um, so we go from one street light to um, lighting that, that highlights the egress and then lighting around the perimeter. And this lobby will be, um, this lobby is a part of our egress path in the building, as any multifamily building will have. And so that building has a certain foot candle that needs to be maintained 24-7 um, in, in that space. So that in the event of an emergency, egress from this stair or egress from the elevator is lit. Chris? I just have a question about the grading. I noticed that one of the ramps leading down to the drop-off area is 5.2%. Um, so how, how is that going to be allowed without a handrail? It's part of the sidewalk, but it's probably something that's created new, right? 5.2% is allowed in, yeah. in, in, in sidewalks. That's well, yeah. allowed. Yeah. Uh, I believe the threshold is 8%. Do you just have a picture of the project? Because I'm, I'm looking at these yes. lines, but what does um, this look like in? Um, I don't. These were in a picture, pictorial way. Yeah, I don't know if I put these on the flash drive. Hold on one second. Chris might have it, Dave. <laughs> oh, and this is actually this is helpful. This is a picture of the granite that was installed when the town redid this, the sidewalk and dropped it. So that this granite and this stair to Grace Church were required because the sidewalk was previously up at about this height. And so we're going to take that same materiality into the, into the uh, site work for the building. It's a um, uh, salt and pepper granite that's used for all the curbing all around town. Where does that um, curbing go? Does the town take it back, or no? That all stays. That's all, that's on Grace Church property. Oh, it is. It's that is. All, but it doesn't. It run all the way. Nope. It stops right there. It does. And so then there's okay. the stair, and then there's the. That is. Here. Yeah, so this is this had to, this had to stay high because this was when they dropped the sidewalk. This is the handicap access into Grace. And so this pitches down 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 and then it's flat for a portion, then it pitches down again and when it pitches down again is where you have that granite wall. Again, that you walk by things all the time and you don't, <laughs> you don't notice. notice. Um So, did you see uh to your question, those are the renderings that um uh, on the project is the sidewalk just all concrete? Nope, it has the, it has the uh, brick paver on either side of it, and then it has the cross uh, patterning in, in the middle. Chris, Chris, isn't that going to be changed, please? <laughs> yeah. So it's being changed in other parts of town. Yeah. Here, um, Mr. Wilson and Mr. Williams are replacing a piece, just a piece of sidewalk in front of their property and all the sidewalk to the west of it and all the sidewalk to the east of it is already this cross-hatched pattern with the brick edge. So they really need to keep in you. conformance with that. Elsewhere in town, we are changing the pattern. It just doesn't have long 
good longevity. But if it's to, I didn't realize it was to the east too. Okay. And I've seen most of the failing when it's perpendicular oh. to the path of travel, and this is parallel, so. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so for the lighting plan, um, we have cut sheets. Uh, here's the exterior lighting. And then I'll pull up the cut sheets as well. There's, there are four different uh, exterior fixtures. E1, which is a downlight in the um, canopies which I'll show you in, in, a, in a quick minute here. E2, which is a <coughs> downlight in the uh, walls, uh, exterior walls. Uh, E3, which is um, uh, another downlight that is in one of the monolithic walls right when you come up to the commercial. And E4, which is uh, only in the very back of the building on the north side. So um, the lighting plan here shows those fixtures. So you have uh, E1 only here in the canopy above the entry, here in the canopy above the uh, commercial entrance, and here in the canopy above the other commercial entrance. So that is this fixture. That'll be installed in the canopy. It's flush mounted down with LED. Uh, E2 is around the perimeter. So this, this wall is a, is a site wall that is, uh, the grade is higher on this side than it is this side to make all the egress work. So that's all stayed the same. This uh, E2 fixture is mounted in the wall and uh, provides a, um, a, a low but required foot candle for egress light around that perimeter all facing onto the site. And that is the E2 fixture here. Excuse me. Yes. At what height on the wall? Uh, well, the, it's a good question. The wall changes because it's, it's managing the grade as this pitches down and this is the highest part of, part of the site. And that is, uh, I believe it is 24 inches above grade trying to keep that as, as uniform as we can without pitching. So it's quite low. It's really to, to, to light the uh, path for egress. Um, E3 is uh, just here and here. So these two walls, uh, again, as per the approved plans, are a large monolithic granite wall that will resemble the wall that the town installed along Grace. And that fixture is also downlit, um, a little bit different because it's more of a ribbon. And so you can see it here. That ribbon um, projects underneath uh, benches uh, that are installed along this wall and this wall. Again, um, in keeping with uh, the approved plans. Excuse me again, sure. I apologize. Can you also show the E2 fixture? Sure. So you can see the face of this is flush with the wall, and then this is recessed into the wall. And then it's a very simple black that is tapered back to allow that light to shine down onto the, onto the walkway. And is the E3 fixture also flush? The E3 fixture is surface mounted, but it's an eighth of an inch thick. It's a, it's a ribbon, a LED ribbon that gets mounted underneath a bench and it lights the, un the underside of the bench. And, David, and that's the ballast. I think everyone's holding their questions until they finish the lighting, just so, yeah, thanks. And then E4 is just back here. There's one um, surface mounted light that'll be on the exterior wall of the building. Let me scroll up here. There's one E4 that's here. And that E4 fixture is this, which is downlight, downlit against the, the back of the building and picked so that it matches uh, the cladding at that part of the building. 
And then as part of this plan, we've put together two photometric plans. So uh, this plan highlights each of those fixtures. Uh, let me see. Uh, how to get over here. And then this is, uh, we've done two photometric plans because this, uh, we've done one that shows how the, the foot candles for the egress, um, and that is reflected in the requirements for the code, which is very small. But the code requirements that we have for site egress and the lobby entry are satisfied by um, effectively the lighting around this, this site wall. And then um, in meeting with uh, the planning staff, um, asked to, to take it to zero, to go beyond that to show how uh, the foot candles are um, impacted beyond that, so beyond where the egress is shown and at the patios and at that space out um, in front of the commercial area. So you can see uh, in this plan there is no light impact anywhere here except around this periphery, uh, the entry to the building and it goes to zero in short order um, right along the property line. So there's, it's, a, it's a very low uh, light impact approach to providing uh, what's required for egress around the exterior of the site. Does anyone have any questions? Chris? I wonder if Mr. Wilson would send me those plans via electronic uh, means? Yes, I did. I, yeah. Could you zoom in on the front entrance? That's yep. In this plan? Eight grade, right. Yep. I just wanted to see what the numbers were. We, it's hard to see. They'll be less than the street light. And where is the street light? The street light would have been here. Which is gone. Which so is there's gone. no other street light. So basically the sidewalks are dark. Uh, no, there's a street light here. That one stays? There's a street light. Yeah, we're not doing anything. We're only, there's street lights on adjacent properties. We're just, the one that landed in the middle of this property, when okay. that, those there, street lights were part of the, the sidewalk. There weren't any on the poles? Uh, on no. On the bump outs? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, that's, that's part that's of what they did do okay. is these street lights were a part of this improvement. Mm. This one was placed in the middle of the property. There was one placed in the oh. right of way and then one placed uh, here. Um, um, on the Jones property. That's what threw me off because they put one on the property. So, yep. okay. Hmm. Can you go back to the light? Sure. Um, just um, curiosity, what are the Kelvins for, like, are you going for a white uh, or a medium? We, uh, it's a good question. We keep this, the specification calls for 3,000 uh, or lower. So a warm oh, light, very I'm warm happy. light. Okay, great. We try to shoot for 2,700 in the building. Oh. Exterior is about 3,000. Great. That makes me happy. Any questions? Chris, do you have any questions? Or are we forgetting anything? We're going on four hours here, so <laughs> we're slowing down. <laughs> It looks to me like they've met the condition number three and number 12. Yes. And number I, 14 sort of goes yep. away because they're not um, relocating the light. Yep, so condition three is, you think, met. That was the detail plans and, okay. So we have to vote to approve this. Is it an addition or? Just no, that they've met the, the conditions right. of number three and number 12. Okay. So did anyone catch that? Is anyone's brain still functioning at this point where they can articulate a motion that says that this has met the conditions that were previously laid out on their permits? Have yes. Have all the other conditions been met? We still have to go to town council. In our conditions, it was called uh, uh, it was, select, uh, select board, board. Mm. but we still have to go to town council. And we still have, similar to the last, uh, um, uh, the last group, we still have to meet with Rob and Chief Livingstone and Chief Nelson to finalize some plans that are separate than plans that need to come back before the planning board. 
So this is, but so all conditions are met for planning board. All conditions relative to the planning board. Yes. Are met relative to getting a building permit. So the, I'm okay. not sure if they have to come back to you later on. I didn't read the conditions um, with that in mind, but these are the conditions they had to meet in order to get their building permit. Okay. <coughs> so we need a motion that says that they have met the conditions laid out for them to obtain their building permit. I think it would be direct, Chris, three and Re refer to conditions them? three, twelve, and fourteen that they've met three, the conditions three, twelve, three, 12 and fourteen. Eight. Yes, that would be good. It's that way, we don't get credit for meeting one we haven't met yet. If you want to, it's on the agenda here. If you want to look, <laughs> I move to approve the project presented by Archipelago Investments. That conditions three, twelve, and fourteen have been submitted and approved. The submittals have been submitted. And we're going to. Yeah. And we're going to improve it. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Raise your hands. And that's. And okay. No. Zero. And abstain. Mm -hmm. One. So it's five. No. Did you? You all said yes, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's five yes, zero no, and one abstain. <laughs> I'm like, now I'm seeing that. I'm like, I thought I saw all the hands go up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. It was a long night. Thank you. We got to skip the first two hours. Do <laughs> it. Unfortunately, we're getting used to it, too. Okay. So granite samples do I want to see what samples they have granite samples in the back are you interested oh, Lord. in seeing well I <laughs> tempting but no we can go see it next to Grace Church yeah yeah same thank granite you. thank you thank you um, so if we back up to item six um, there's no ZBA report so we can skip all that and uh, we have a signing of decision. That, can we just sort of do that and then I can yeah. sign it after? <laughs> we need uh, either Greg to come back or Perry. Yeah. Um, but the rest of you can sign it and Ms. McGowan won't sign it. Yeah. So here, here they come. So you'll just and pass. Yeah. Yep. And I can do that. I can sign the minutes like after we close the meeting, right? Like meaning to keep it rolling. Um, so can we postpone item new business item B, uh, downtown planning? Do you want to talk about downtown planning right now? For five minutes. For five minutes. Is that okay with everyone? Five minutes, we'll start the clock. Mm -hmm. Max five minutes. minutes. Um, uh, for, for Chris to talk, to tell us about it for five minutes, or? I could, I could talk about what Chris told me, um, that there's money for um, sort of restarting the downtown conversation. So I was yes. hoping to, um, let's schedule a date and do that. Um, and there's money for like a facilitator and then the other thing I was hoping is to sort of get a document that incorporated what people said at the last two meetings because I thought there was a lot of good information that came out of that. I went to the second session where they had the breakout groups. I think with your husband was in my breakout group and there were a lot of really interesting ideas about things when people wanted Those to see downtown. The there was there were no sure. names attached to anything but there were like the groups had a lot of like fun and interesting ideas of way things they'd like to see downtown. So I think people, if they can see the results of what they've said, like, you know, that they were heard or there's a record of that, that would kind of help us jump start and get people to re-engage because I know people care about it a lot. So that's, that's my minute and a half, I think. So um, normally we do incorporate, or you all, the planning department does 
and then puts it somewhere up on the website. That never happened for that I think it last happened, forum. We've had happened so for many. the first one, but it didn't happen for the second one. So we have to okay. go back and sort of reconstruct it for the second so one. So you'll pull that together and put them back up. All right. And then, Janet, you were saying you want to schedule a, a meeting. There's probably time in October because I think already that sounds good. 18th of September is getting kind of full. Yeah. Right. Good. Yay. Um, good. And then, so item uh, section nine, form A, are there any um, ANRs? I hate to tell you, there are. Oh, God. <laughs> how many? Three? I think there are three. And. In the blue folder. Oh, in the blue folder. Oh, this. I sent the blue They're folder. They're in here. So, if you pass me back you, the yeah, let me materials. just pull out the signy things. Oh, signy. No, out. Sorry. no, this sorry. is all signy. I pulled stuff. them out already, so I'm going to come down and show them to you, um, or maybe I'll just pass them along. Here, you can. You can sign. If you want to start? Well, some of them you sign, and then I'll, I can. So yeah. the first one I'm going to pass you is. Um, Property that is owned by Michael Kittredge's family, and it has a very odd configuration currently. Um, they divided it into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lots, three of which are flag lots, which are um, really not very developable because the back part of them is in wetland. And so um, the realtor who's representing the family is uh, suggesting that they redo the lot lines to create, I think, three lots. One of the lots has been sold off. So when I come by and show you the big plan, um, I'll show you which one has been sold off. And then uh, what you're doing here is um, declaring that this is not a subdivision. Um, a and R stands for approval not required. So subdivision approval is not required for this because there's no roadway being created. There's no subdivision being created. It's merely um, redoing lots on front, redoing lot lines for frontage lots. That would be nice to know. I think this is Leverett Road. Uh, yeah, as opposed to East Leverett. Yep, Leverett Road. Yes, that's Leverett correct. Leverett Road. Jack, actually, I'll take them back because I haven't signed them. I'm just stacking my junk up. But, but you and Janet signed these? No, or, no, we're not on that. No? Oh, God, I that's me. I don't, know don't worry about it. Well, that one's the dog part, but I had the other one. I saw you walking with your dog. So they've taken these seven lots and created three lots out of them? Seven, seven uh, into two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the Where is the existing the house? Is that created? The existing lot lines are there. It's kind of hard to. Um, yeah. Am I, am I, am I this way? Yeah. Right left here. Right here right uh, right that right looks right, here. Janet. And, okay, got it. Yeah. And one flag right like here. Mm -hmm. so oh my gosh. Here, this weird shape, mm -hmm. triangular shape. And then there's this one, and then there's this one. So what they're doing is they're. Combining this wow. and this to make one lot, they're combining these two uh, access strips and creating and this and creating a lot that goes back like that, and then they are um, creating this lot. Right? Mm -hmm. No, this and this are being combined. So the building circles show where the buildings are going to go. There's going to be one house here, one house here, and one house here, and there's already a house. So there. nothing on this one and. Well, this one already is built. No, I mean, I'm so sorry, that goes that's part of this the to the back. Well, this lot is like all of this now. It's not going to be a flag lot anymore. It's going to be a frontage lot. So oh. this line is going away. This line is going away. So this lot here oh, includes one, this. Two, mm -hmm. three. Yeah. One, so they're only going to have four. Two, three. Three. Right, and four. And four. Yep. Yeah, because isn't that in the back? There's railroad, but there's power lines back there. Yeah. Yeah, this is a white uh, Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So they're just creating three. 
Well, that actually makes more sense what they're doing because mm -hmm. in the back is mm -hmm. just power lines and railroad. Nobody would want to build it. No, I wouldn't want to so see anybody build so there either. What you're doing is authorizing Christine to sign this for mm. I think the yeah. Amherst Media folks want to talk to you. Uh, yeah, are you talking? Yeah? We're muttering. Should this still talk about Yes. Okay, just check. Sorry. The ANR gets weird, I know. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like the back of Chris. They're like, what's going on? Thank you. Put it for you. Thank you. Except, you know, two of them are for Greg. But. Yeah. <laughs> they will, I promise. As long as these two haven't come up with too much work for us. Okay, this is property on East Levert Road, East, where East um, there are very strange shapes to these lots. Um, <laughs> Stranger I'm, I'm than the last. Pass, <laughs> exactly. I'm going to pass around the plan that shows the existing shapes, True. and then I will describe the proposed yes. shape. And the proposed shape is meant to include a well. So um, there's a well between these two properties. Um, the person who has the house wants the well on his property, obviously, so he can control it. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy can dig his own well if he needs to. Dig his own so. well, okay. A spite well. Yeah, a spite well. So that we were just now? over here with Kittredge and come down and State Street is yeah. here. But what, what and then it, come what up. Will it be here? That is Here's a house. It's yeah. just a house and then these That's, are existing houses. This is my house. I don't want to actually say who lives there, there, but I know my who lives there. Right there. Oh, my yeah. <laughs> so so they're oh, splitting this off. Oh, okay. All they're doing is they're changing this lot line so that they can grab this well wow. for this property. And they, they do have legal lots. They've got their building circles. They've got appropriate frontage. They've got appropriate uh, lot size. But they're very strangely shaped. And this one mm -hmm. is all the way down to here. So are these buildings there? Are these are there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so two houses right. and a barn? Is that what I'm looking at? Yes. Yeah. OK. Right. And so they're taking the well. And then there's no house on this lot. Not yet. Okay. No. And they squeezed out that frontage by dragging yeah. the point out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. Well. Creative. I know. And the next one's even crazier. The last one we haven't heard back from the town engineer. We always send these A and R plans to the town engineer in case he has any questions or suggestions. And for this one, it's uh, Market Hill Road. And um, as I said, we haven't heard back from him, but I'll show you where it is located. Let's see. Maybe Miss uh, Field Sadler can tell me what's going on here. <laughs> this shows the the location of the lot, and it's probably the location of the lot before it is subdivided. I haven't looked at the um, the proposal, so I'm going to send this down the line. last year and it yeah. never actually no. grew. Um, so there's a kennel here. They want to subdivide that. Not, not subdivide it. 
I want to divide this lot off. Um, the wow. bank, for some reason, uh, doesn't want this lot to include this, and I can't remember why. So this is labeled not a separate building lot, this piece here. Wow. And then this is being reserved. I don't actually Are they going to tear down that? They're the just cutting, cutting out that, just the, cutting where out the, that little chunk. They're, they're cutting chunk. this piece off, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like just Actually, it goes like this. Like this. This, is, this is not a flag lot? No. no. It's not. It doesn't have enough frontage. It's only got 20 feet of frontage. And then There's it's no purpose. building circle. Okay, so I don't really know why. So why are they keeping it separate and not attaching it to this? I don't know. What's, who's the next one over? Is that owned or is it? Yeah, that's a private house. Anne and David Maxson. Chris, just side question. Do our letters told when this is happening? No. Really? No, but it's, wow. a, it's a quirk of Massachusetts land use law that allows this to happen. Wow. And it doesn't really happen in other states. That kennel is a, is a commercial facility, isn't it? I, mean, I think it's, it's been closed, been closed for a few years. years. It's been closed for six or eight years, yeah. yeah. But it's... It was, wasn't it? Was yes, it not? I understand. Yeah. I brought my sister-in-law's dog there like four years, oh, five yeah. years ago. Yeah. Okay, so um, the question here is, once we hear back from the town engineer, will you authorize Ms. Graymullen to come in and sign this plan? What is, what is the town engineer deciding? He looks at the plan and makes sure that it complies with all kinds of regulations. And if he knows that one of the sites needs an easement over the other one, like one of those frontage lots, he made a point of pointing out to us one of them needs an easement over the other one after, when the lot is sold. They're jointly held right now. Mm -hmm. um, and when they're jointly held, they don't have to have easements. But once one lot is sold, if there's a driveway that passes over one lot to the next lot, then one of them has to have an easement. So, so is there so any tells us what's, a, what's a disadvantage of just waiting till our next meeting to do this one? That would be great, except that we only have 21 days in which to <coughs> act on these yeah. plans. So um, <coughs> it sort of puts pressure on us, and we're not meeting again until the 24th. Until the 18th so of he September. probably looks at it a lot for septic, and he looks at it for things like right. That. Yeah. And so that was my only thought with this being such a small site. Small. But if it's yeah. got the building circle, and I, I don't know, because that's septic that they're on I Title asked Five the up there. I commissioner aren't they? about that, and he said he thought they could fit a well and a septic. Okay. Uh, I mean, they can build. Uh, they can build them there? small no. now. No. Yeah, we have town water. Yeah. Oh, you do have time. Right, but I don't know, I don't know where it goes up that far. Place. I'm on that road. The building I mean, commissioner said yeah. that yeah. you can fit, right, well, okay. Yeah. okay. The building commissioner did building look at commissioner this. Okay, then. Yeah. So I don't understand why. South East Street is, or North East Street is over there. Uh, what? Why those roads? Yeah. Where's North East Street? Or North East Street is way down this way. Yeah, way down. Yeah. This is oh, so up. Flat Hills this is leads a, into a high elevation. Yeah, it's, yeah, you're, it's way you're up on a rise. This is past the They might have space for it, but then they oh, yeah. have to work it. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. This is way up the hill. Yeah. But they would have to put a new one in, and the new ones are good. Okay. Okay? Yeah, okay. All right. These are, uh, yeah. So, do we have to move or? Um, well, what I think we're, Chris is still torturing us a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. We're, we're getting close. Um, so are there any upcoming ZBA applications? Just say zero. <laughs> When is that coming back?
may I just say something, which is that um, just for Janet's benefit, um, one of the reasons that we tell you about these ZBA applications is if you hear one of them, hear about one of them, and you want to have a presentation, um, we can invite the applicant to come in and give you a presentation. And you may want a presentation about the solar on the old or uh, new landfill. That might be one that's big enough for you to want to see. Um, it's possible that you'd want to see the tip-up one as well, the um, two-family house, non-owner occupied on North Whitney Street. That's going to have some site issues related to it. And what is Aspen Heights coming back for? Yeah, Aspen Heights has already been approved. It's shrunk yeah. from four stories to two stories. It's only 88 units with 11 affordable units. Um, and I think this is just to prove, similar to the way Kyle, Kyle and Dave came to you tonight, to show that they had met um, condition requirements. They're and just to ask you back. for approval. Okay. That's what they're coming back for. So on the duplex, is it owned by, by the owner? Are they trying to convert it to a non-owner? Or did someone buy it? It's owned by a developer and someone who owns property in town who rents it currently, and he's adding a, um, a new dwelling. I mean, he's got a four-bedroom four uh, single family, and he's adding, uh, he wants to add another four-bedroom single family. So it's kind of a big project, and it's going to have a fairly big effect on the neighborhood. So if you wanted to see that. Um, Yep, we sure. could invite them to come in on the 18th. Right now, our coping is low, so we're like, no, not more. But no, I think, we'd, I think we, we would we would want to see that. Yeah. And the solar farm. Okay. Solar farm hasn't been um, no date submitted yet. yet. Right. So we don't have a date yet. But it's out there. But you'd like to see it. Okay. Uh, upcoming SPP SPR SU. I can't think of any. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, at that point, I think we should just have a motion to end. Or a oh, report of chair. There is no zero. And report of staff, do you have anything? Thank you for your tolerance and for thank tonight's. Thank you, Chris, for we're all here together. Um, so adjournment, motion. Move to adjourn. Yeah. Second. All in favor, yes, done. You. Wow. Four hours and 15 minutes. Thank you, Amherst Media.